Uh, this is going to be a fantastic day. I mean, just working with the individuals who are, I'm going to introduce you to, it's been captivating. I've already learned a ton. So sit back, enjoy the day. As your moderator, let me just walk you through this. Today is really all about how best to integrate SDF into our dental practices. And with it, there's so much to share and talk about. We have five, I think, wonderful presenters today. Each has a different role and direction on what they're really bringing to this webinar. So I think it's going to be not only interactive, it'll be entertaining. And I'm going to say it's global because our first speaker is speaking from, from down under. It's really about answering all your questions and navigating the pathways of integrating SDF into your practices. And the question is, is really, is this a new concept? And the answer is, it's not a new concept. And per the ADA report three years ago on fluoride varnish and silver diamine fluoride, the study was really presented about silver diamine fluoride. And with one application, it can prevent 60 to 70% of uh, decay. And with a second application, it can prevent up to 90%. Yet it's three years old, revolutionary. We've got to get this adaptation really going. And yet dentistry is just too slow. We know how dentistry goes. And it's a hot topic. The Washington Post, uh, World Health Organization talks about how we can be treating uh, extensive dental caries restorations. Health Magazine talks about just a few brush strokes. So is it that simple? No. Are there a lot of technique tips that you're going to walk away from with the science? You bet. And that's what today is all about. So let's get into this, I think, really exciting subject. And I'm going to walk through the flow today. My first speaker is, he just walks the walk. Uh, Jeff presented to Catapult, the Catapult group a few years ago in Hawaii. He, he is what I, he redefines minimally invasive or minimally interceptive dentistry. And he's gonna take us on our first dive into this for 30 minutes. Then my buddy Ron's gonna come on and he's gonna share a video, just a hands-on video. And then we'll be talking about that. Now, many of you have the hands-on kit. We'll give you time to play with it, get it ready. If not, you'll have it ready after the course. After Ron, I've had the pleasure of getting to know Justin. He's out of Tufts. He's a clinical instructor out of there as a private practice, walks the walk, and he's got a lot of interesting things on codes and far more. Janine Weiss in military garb and ready today. She'll be showing us a video of her life during COVID. And last but not least, my dear friend from up north in Canada, Carla Cohn, a general dentist who really works only on kids in her practice and teaches at a university part-time. She'll be going through modern, different approaches with SDF therapies. That'll bring us to our Q&A, and our Q&A will be a panel discussion. You'll hear a lot from Jeff Knight, I guarantee it. I guarantee it. And if you have questions for our presenters, go into our chat box and let us know those questions. We'll be moderating those questions and we will get to them. Okay, without further ado, I am going to bring on Jeff Knight. I'm going to let you take it away. Show them your brilliance. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's uh, certainly a privilege to uh, present to you. I spent quite a few years looking at silver diamond fluoride and, and also um, silver diamond fluoride and potassium iodide. And I did a PhD on that, which I finished in 2008. Um, at this stage, I must disclose I have a financial interest in this product, Reva Star, but um, that, uh, that just needs to get out. But I just, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's an exciting time to be a dentist. Um, I just wish I had more time doing it because uh, dentistry is moving uh, so quickly in so many different areas. But uh, this, this, we now have a way of actually sort of controlling, uh, controlling tooth decay, which is something that uh, when I was a young dentist, the whole idea was that you had to cut the caries out. And um, 
I just think of the terrible damage that we we caused uh, we caused people in that uh, in that process. Now there are really there are four clinical applications of, of SDS and, and Rebastar. The first one is, is treating hypersensitivity. Now this is a, an on-label treatment because uh, and certainly in the states and here in Australia, uh, that's all we're allowed. Really, that the we all that's the only treatment they're allowed to do under FDA and our TGA uh, standards. Canada, I believe, you can actually sort of use it as an anti-carry device. So the second application is for triage and caries, and that's uh, I'll talk about that. The third application is actually improving the clinical benefits of a glass on cement. Uh, many have heard of ART. Uh, this, this is a traumatic restorative treatment that, uh, that Joe Franken uh, introduced. Well, this is a silver modified version. So they call it silver modified ART or SMART, which I think is one of the best acronyms I've heard of. And the fourth thing, and many of you probably won't know, it's an, it's an adjunct to uh, endodontic treatment. Um, I have a very stable practice that uh, I've been doing for many years and most of my patients are geriatric like me and therefore I'm doing a lot of endo and um, it certainly it's changed the game of endodontics I just um, I wouldn't know how to how to uh, how to, to tackle some of the things I do without uh, without this rebus part. So let's look about the, the surface preparation because this is very important um, unlike just using silver diamond fluoride uh, rebus star requires a uh, uh, quite a sort of a specific surface preparation. And um, you look at sort of both SDF or, or SDFKI, it doesn't stain um, intact enamel or dentine surfaces. But as soon as you've got a surface that's been changed, then, then it's able to penetrate and there's like it like the stain. Now, this is a, a sample of, uh, of an intact enamel that's been etched for 15 seconds. And then I fractured it and you can see there the interprismatic spaces you actually have, you see the spaces between there, and this actually allows the, the, SD, the uh, SDF and the, and the, uh, or the, Reva, the Reva star to actually penetrate an enamel surface. You can see there that um, what's, what, you're, what you're seeing here is a, is a dye called uh, rhodamine B dye, um, which has been added to the potassium iodide because it doesn't, doesn't work with the silver diamond fluoride. And you can see there that 3D representation of the um, of the interprismatic enamel, which the uh, which the silver iodide has penetrated. And looking at a cross polarized view, it's exactly the same thing. The first 50 microns, under that you can see that dark stain is a silver iodide, and then you can also see, which is interesting, there's been a crack in the enamel, and the silver iodide has penetrated all the way down there to the to the on the dentine below. So. It, um, it just you can see the, the amazing benefits you get with this material if you're going to use it as a, a fissure protector. But uh, I don't have time for that today. So let's look at the, the protection of dentine. Now, again, this, this 15 second etch is very important. On the first slide, you see on the conditioning slide, you see that I've used a polycrylic acid for 10 seconds. I've applied the uh, silver diamond fluoride, and I've applied the potassium iodide. And you see there's very little penetration, but then, and then I put a glass on the cement on top. But when I etch it for 15 seconds, as you can, as you can see there, you can see the penetration of the, uh, of the silver iodide penetrating down through the dentinal tubules. And also in that anastomosis between the dentinal tubules, you can actually see the, you see the, those little penetration of silver iodide. So you get this, this very strong antibacterial bar barrier of uh, silver iodide across the surface of the tooth. And also the other thing etching for 15 seconds, you can see there, this is the, this is the, the mineral dissolved on the outer collagen matrix. When you, when you actually go and etch it for 15 seconds, you remove a lot of the mineral content, expose the collagen, and this is, this is how you stop uh, the Reva star from staining. Because if you don't do that, the problem with the Reva star is that the, the silver iodide molecule is quite unstable. And therefore, if you actually sort of, if you just use it, put Reva star onto a tooth that hasn't been etched, and, then, and say you're using a resin modified glass on a cement, and you go ahead and you put a curing light on that, uh, it'll turn black. And the reason being is that the silver iodide molecule is quite unstable. But if you expose the, the uh, denatured collagen, what happens is you can see there on the screen, the silver iodide actually bonded onto the, the denatured collagen. And that's a, that's a, a protein complex which is a very strong bond, and then it doesn't, it doesn't break down. So let's look at the differences between um, silver diamond fluoride and, and, and silver diamond fluoride and potassium iodide, because it really, it's not just that people say, oh, I can use the silver diamond fluoride and the potassium iodide doesn't work. It's not like that. 
It's a completely different chemical reaction. Now, let me show you. Okay, so let's look at a, 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 an SEM, scan electron microscope view of, of SDF. Now, you can see there on the top, on the left-hand screen, the silver penetrates um, with the uh, down the dentile tubules. Now, on a, on a scan electron microscope, you can't see the fluoride, but you can see the silver. So there we have, the, you can see that the penetration down towards the base of the caries there, uh, deep, uh, going deep into the caries. But when you look at the uh, potassium iodide, what you see there is you get these the silver salts, the silver iodide is actually um, limited to the first 50 microns just under the, under the lesion. And, uh, and you say, well, that's no good. The thing is that it is because that, that layer of silver iodide is, a, is a, an amazing antibacterial layer. I mean, before the advent of antibiotics, what we used to do is to, uh, we use silver and we use iodine as some of the best um, antibacterials we had available to us. And I said, this stuff has all been, all been published. And if you go to, if you Google uh, Jeff Knight, uh, Quintessence International 2009, the study will come up and you can see it. Now here's, again, to confirm that, here's a, a light microscopy. Uh, of, of, uh, this is actually a deciduous tooth that uh, was restored with silver diamond fluoride and river star. And you can see there on the silver diamond fluoride side, you can see the, uh, the silver, which again, we've already can see on a light microscope, you can't see the fluoride, penetrating deeply into the entire tubules, where you can see there, that's 50 micron bar there, and it's all within the first 50 microns of the surface. So basically that the silver diamond fluoride penetrates uh, down the dentile tubules, um, and, but, and the river star, the silver iodide is all attached to the surface. And again, further looking at this, if we look at an EPMA, which is called electron probe microanalysis, um, that's a fancy word for a, a, a scan electron microscope that can pick up various, um, various compounds. And you can see there on the, um, on the, uh, the, on the SDF curve, which is the, which is the, uh, uh, the purple one there, uh, the how again, it's all, all the silver's penetrated in the first 50 microns. And so when you're using Rebastar, and you look at the surface, you'll see the carry suddenly had this sort of this fuzzy white appearance, which is the silver iodide, the creamy white silver iodide on the surface. However, when you're looking at the silver diamond fluoride, you see it's penetrated sort of there through it right into the depths of the depths of the caries, which is there. And those little spikes show it's actually in the dentile tubules. Now, of course, but when you put on silver diamond fluoride, of course, the, 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 uh, the lesion goes black uh, because of the, the silver precipitates out eventually and, and, uh, and, and, and that's sort of a, a, a dark stain. Now, this is, the, this is where it really gets interesting. You look at the fluoride. Now, the fluoride, the lethal dose of fluoride for strep mutans is about 2,000 parts per million. You can see that here we have the slide of the, of the, of the, of the two, two different types of fluoride. So when you use um, silver diamond fluoride, it, it penetrates into the fluoride element, penetrates into the caries about 1% and virtually goes to the depths of the caries or about 1.5%. Now that's well over 5,000 parts per million. So it's basically three times the lethal dose required to actually go ahead and kill the strep mutans. But look at this, when you use the silver diamond fluoride potassium iodide on, what happens is that the, the actual fluoride level goes up to 2.5%, which is well over 10,000 times which is more than five or six times the level of fluoride to kill the strep mutans in the, uh, in the, in the dental tubules. And the other thing is, look how far it goes into the tooth. It just goes well beyond the sort of the depths of the carry. So you, what you're doing is when you use the, the Reva, Reva Star, you're actually turning the caries into a decay resistant base and lethal the restoration. So it's important to leave the caries behind because the more caries you leave behind, the more ability you have to sort of kill strep mutans from going ahead and, and re-attacking re, uh, the tooth. So what we're doing here is we're working with the teeth, we're not working on the teeth. And this is the way that we actually should be looking at, at, at dentistry. Now, what's the reason for this? Now, the, the, and the thing is that the, the difference in the fluoride concentration is to be attributed to the fact that the SDF, that the SDF uh, binds, binds the fluoride ion atoms to the molecule, and that's the, the fluoride has to go with the silver. But of course, when you actually have that chemical reaction with the SDFKI, potassium iodide and silver iodides form, then the fluoride ions are released into the into the uh, into the into the, the caries and are able to pass freely at a much higher concentration of the dentine. This is a 
a good friend of mine, Eddie Lynch in, uh, in England, had sort of explained this. I couldn't work it out, but um, he's one of these amazing academics who's, uh, who's, who's probably forgotten more dentistry than I've ever learned, I think. So now, Reba Star is a sense it's available in bottles and also in capsules. Now, the major problem with the bottle is, well, that's what I found. <laughs> that was all we had it when we first started using it, uh, that you actually have a small drop of liquid now that because the 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 uh, silver the ammonia component is so um, so volatile when you actually tip the bottle up again you get a little blob of uh, of uh, silver diamond fluoride going over the over the neck of the bottle and running down down the side and uh, it used to get all over the opening because you'd pick it up with a gloved hand and and then you'd touch something and you would touch a bracket table and you end up with a dark stain there now. The way to get rid of that's quite simple. You just get some um, some sodium hypochlorite, some household bleach. Uh, you get you get a sheet of uh, a, a, a tissue uh, a paper towel, cut a segment out, um, saturate it with the household bleach, put it on the stain overnight, and you'll come back in the morning and it's gone. The other way, of course, you can get it um, is by if you go ahead and, and the way to stop this is just get a piece of electrical tape and wrap it around the neck of the bottle, and this completely sort of the silver diamond fluoride catches in there and you don't have to worry about uh, getting rid of the stain. The other way it's available in these little capsules. Um, look, as a, as a dentist, the cost of materials is really about 5% of our, our cost as dentists. So if you've got something that makes it faster and easier, then a lot of dentists will say, well, that's what I prefer to use. So let's look at the a protocol for triaging caries. So with, with, silver diamond, with the silver diamond fluoride, and this is, I got this off the, uh, the Elevate website. Um, you remove the surface bioload, so you get a bit of the blood pus from yesterday's lunch, as you do. You isolate the tooth with cotton rolls, or if you, if you want to use rubber dam, you can. Um, you apply a one drop of silver diamond fluoride for at least a minute. So it needs a minute to actually sort of, apparently, to actually work. And then you gently uh, blow dry. Okay, now if you're using the Reba Star, different kettle of fish. You remove the surface bio load, okay, you isolate the tooth, okay, you etch for 15 seconds, then you wash and dry it. So this etching is really important. I can't stress that enough. There's no point in using Reba Star unless you're doing the 15 second etch beforehand. Then you apply one drop of SDF. Now the SDF has got a pH of 13. So it's uh, the, where the elevator's got a pH of 10. But you've got to leave the elevator on for a minute. And of course, it's a, if you stick your hand in a fire, no matter how hot the fire is, it's going to burn. But the thing with the, uh, with the Reva Star is you put the drop of SDF on and then immediately uh, reapply the potassium iodide, but you've got to leave a white precipitate on the surface. So if you're using it to restore a teeth, you've got to apply the potassium iodide till the precipitate clears. But if you're using it for triaging caries, you've got to leave it on the surface, and I'll show you why in a minute. And then you just gently blow dry and dismiss the patient. Now, this is the reason why. You see there, this is the control. It's been in a, been in a chemostat, so it's been a, the caries uh, or the dentine disc has been subject to um, uh, strep mutans and lactobacillus attack for a couple of weeks. You can see there, it's completely overwhelmed. When you look at the SDF, you see that there's actually, you can see these little uh, strep mutans there, tiny little things, about one, mil one micron in diameter. It's about sort of 10 microns wide there, so that they can go down those dentile tubules 10 abreast once they get a taste for it. But the problem is, of course, is that they can still, the, the, even though you can't get a form of a, 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 a bioload on the surface because the silver diamond fluoride prevents that, it's still possible the strep mutans, once this effect starts to wear off, they can go sort of munching down the dentile tubules. But if you leave the white precipitate there with the, uh, with the, with the Reva Star, you can see the dentile tubules are totally blocked with silver iodide. And of course, that prevents them from, that just keeps those little strep mutants out for, um, for long. And the silver iodide is quite a, quite a stable salt, but it will stain. That's the other, that's the other issue. And then I'll explain that in a minute. Okay, so this is some of the, so the really amazing things we can do with, with this product. I mean, it's, it's really, um, it's playing a very disrupting role, particularly in, in, uh, in managing caries in vulnerable populations. Um, the public clinics, are so we here in Australia, we have these public clinics and people churn through and they come in um, to the dental hospital and they've got sort of, they've got a couple of teeth that are troubling them, they have the teeth taken out and they come back in a couple of weeks later, they have two more teeth, they had a couple of months. Now, 
clinic like that and say, well, look, while, it, while the anesthetic's working and the patient's sort of happy with it, just let me put some stuff on your teeth that'll slow the churning down. So that creates a totally changes the delivery system because it means that in a public clinic, people, the same patients come back and back. You can stop this churning and stop them coming, stop them coming back again. And so it introduces amazing efficiencies into, into the management in public in public health system. Um, where you've got, uh, certainly I know here in Australia, I'm probably sure it's the same in, in the States and Canada, public health system is overwhelmed with, it, with, with demand. And um, you've got to just, uh, I think in Australia, it's 15 months before you can get an appointment. And so the fact is that they can actually sort of triage these caries and sort of stop the disease and they can bring people back and start, uh, and start treating them. And this is a thing that's really important. It dramatically reduces the need for GAs in young children. And one of the, one of the things that really upsets me as a, as a dentist is that the, the number of kids who get GAs for, um, for, for treatment, and they may just be sort of a, a bit recalcitrant or won't cooperate. And um, the, the, the pediatric dentists seem to sort of love doing GAs. I bet they wouldn't do them to their grandchildren because it, um, you, you give a general anesthetic to a young child, it interferes with their neural development. And, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, there's been two studies done in Australia, one here in Melbourne where I am and one in Tasmania um, where they've had children who are uncooperative children and they've used the Reva star on them. And, uh, and I think there was only one kid who needed uh, general anaesthetic and there was a hundred kids in, in the studies and one kid needed a general anaesthetic and they had to take some teeth out. So it's a, it's, a, it's a real game changer from that point of view. And I think of anything, that's the thing that, that really sort of that I think this, this is a huge contribution to, uh, to, to our profession. Um, very simple treatment protocols. So you can, you can take it to remote locations, um, nursing homes and schools and go off, off site and, uh, and apply it there. And it's just, um, it's just, uh, just, just terrific. Uh, it also provides a means, um, I know a lot of, a, a lot of dentists uh, do pro bono stuff. They go into emerging economies and they have little or no dental infrastructure. And you can get in there and you can sort of treat them. I mean, they've, they've taken on Western values. They've taken on the high carbohydrate, high, high, high carbohydrate, carbohydrate diet. They've got, um, they've got diabetes and the kids have all got caries. Well, at least we can, uh, we can stop the caries. So you look at the benefits of Reva Star over SDF and realize I've got a financial interest in this. So you've got to turn up your crap detectors. But the itching, itching 15 seconds prior to Rivastar removes the bioload for the dentile tubules, and that's really important. And it probably works with SDF, but I haven't, I haven't done any work on that. Now, the high pH of Rivastar 13 is far more bactericidal than, than SDF, which got a pH of 10 or, or elevate. But the precipitate dissolves out more tooth mineral into the caries, and therefore uh, it, it sort of, it, it actually sort of is, is far more effective. It also goes up a pH concentrated grade. Right? And as soon as you put the potassium iodide on, the pH goes back to nine. So you've got this, this benefit and it's put on immediately. So it's a, it's a much faster application system. You've got to leave the SDF on for at least a minute, whereas the Reva Star just goes on you know, then you put the potassium iodide on immediately. Okay. Reva Star fills the dental tubules with silver iodide to form a bactericidal seal. Uh, the fluoride release from uh, Reva Star is almost twice the concentration of FDF and it penetrates much further into the caries. A cavity can be restored in the same visit uh, with, uh, with Reva Star. Uh, it's slightly different uh, protocol, and I'll show you that in a minute without start, uh, starting now, but Reva, Reva Star will stain. And the reason is that the, the, because you've got uh, exposed caries, as the tooth remineralizes, it's incorporating sulfur ions and sulfur ions into it. Now, all sulfur salts are black. And so what you'll get a situation is that over a period of time, of about a month, you'll start to see the, the triaging uh, cavity start to go brown. And that's because of the, uh, of the remineralizing caries incorporating sulfur salts. So people say, oh, the river star goes brown. Well, you've got to cover it with something if you want to make it work. Okay, so let's look at the pulpal response of the river star and SDF. And this is a study that was done by Theo Gotchamanis way back in 96. I mean, this stuff's been around since the 70s. It's really amazing. So this is a glass on a cement restoration uh, on a, on a on a on caries, leaving caries behind. And you can see there that there's 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 minimal secondary dentine there, and also you've got this heavy polymorph infiltration where tooth has been treated with uh, silver diamond fluoride, and you can see it up there on the top uh, on the top left hand side of the screen. Look at that that the there's a very healthy layer of secondary dentine 
and a, and a very low polymorph infiltration. You can see the silver iodide up there, very close to the pulp. So let's look at the, the straw-in teeth with Reba Star. Okay, so the stone associated with, with the smart restoration can be avoided by applying potassium iodide um, immediately after the SDF application until the precipitate clears. We see there, there's a tooth that's been, uh, the, the silver diamond fluoride being treated on the, the glass almost mineral on the left-hand side or the right-hand side and the left-hand side. Um, it's been just a, a, a Reva star. Um, the tooth been exposed in direct sunlight for, for, for 12 weeks. So the energy from the sun still hasn't changed the color. Uh, and the potassium iodide scab scabbers the free silver iodide to form the silver iodide, which is a creamy white precipitate. Now it's really important. And some of the things I've got to stress are really important. Only use this treatment on asymptomatic caries. Um, you've heard of pouring salt on a wound. Well, that's what you'll get uh, if you put um, uh, if you put Reva Star on a on a symptomatic caries. And, and how do I know that? <laughs> because I've done it, and it's one of those things you, you do you, you do you do once and you don't do it again. And the other thing, if you want this stuff to work properly, um, you've got to follow a very strict treatment protocol. The problem is that it's it's all done done off label. And people use their imagination and the way they're applying Reva Star. And, it, and I've heard some pretty, I've read some articles which there's been some pretty rare, uh, pretty sort of strange protocols about applying it. So we call this extra smart because it's an extra smart way of doing it. It's a single surface restoration, and there I'd use a glass on the cement. We do a multi surface restoration, and, and I usually do a, a sandwich restoration. I know a lot of you in the States. Uh, think that glass on them cement's uh, next thing to poison and don't use it. So I'm show you a technique where you can actually sort of restore a tooth uh, with composite resin uh, using Revastar with a resin modified glass on a cement adhesive uh, as an intermediary between the two. So tunnel restorations, I've been doing these for a long time and it really, uh, it's, a, it's just a, such a fast way to treat uh, initial uh, proximal caries. Um, glass on them cement or the ART technique is really only good for single surface restorations. But a tunnel, a tunnel restoration is in fact two single surface restoration on the same tooth. So to repair the tunnel restoration. Now I haven't got time to go into this because I've only got 30 minutes, but I'm doing a I'm doing a live webinar with uh, Ray Bertolotti and, and Graham Milicic um, on the I think the 9th of, of November. And if you contact um, if you contact the people at SDI there. Uh, they will give you a link to the webinar. But that's as I go into this sort of far more, far more detail than I can at the moment. So again, you etch for 15 seconds, you wash and dry, apply the Reva Star, wash and dry. Okay. Now this is the, this is where it really gets sort of super fast. Okay. First thing you do is you place the mylar strip in approximately, and you put a, a GP point wedge in to hold it there very firmly. Then you slightly overfill the cavity with a glass on cement, put a cure glass on the cement. Uh, a Kedak Mola, no, Reva Self Cure, Fuji 9, any of these products, they're all good products. And then you ask the patient to start to close slowly in a retruded position. So touch the back of your palate with the tip of your tongue. And they actually, when they actually sort of feel the mylar, they touch on the mylar strip and they stop. You get a periodontal probe and you fold the periodontal probe over the surface. And you say, okay, Sally, I want you to close together. And of course, what you've done there, you've actually used the mylar strip as both a proximal and an occlusal matrix. This forces the uh, any glass on the cement deep into, into the uh, cavity and so eliminating voids and also acts as an occlusal matrix. So it, it makes a, a class two cavity uh, so easy to, to restore or well, initial. And you can see that's what it looks like. I've used a wooden wedge there, but this is a really slide. Um, I use GP points now because they're much more efficient. Now, this is a clinical case. This, uh, this chap, uh, came along for a second opinion. And um, he said that he, dentist had told him he had to have two teeth out um, because he needed, you know what he needed? He needed two implants. And he said, but teeth aren't causing me any trouble. He said, I just wondered why I needed these implants. So the, the, the dentist had already managed to hook the, uh, the, the, the lower first molar, but the upper second molar was asymptomatic. Deep, uh, deep caries, no doubt. So um, I just did a couple of tunnel restorations there. That you can see there, you can see the outline of the wedge. Now, I put two mylar strips in and filled them both at the same time. You haven't got to worry about taking the caries out. It's all sort of, it's just a, just sort of, a, just a blow down. Was there. You can see that the, 
because of the the, uh, the high pH of the of the silver diamond fluoride, a lot of caries have precipitated out there. You can see it so you can see that the tissue is healing. And here we have six weeks later, you can see that that, that caries is healed. I mean, and, and look at the and there's the restoration. Now, how long would that take if you had to do those two restorations, picking away, making sure you didn't get exposure? Those two restorations took me 20 minutes. So you can see there that the, the speed at which you can start moving across the ground if you're using this product is just amazing because you don't have to worry about removing all the caries because what we're doing is we're helping the tooth to heal itself. We're working with the tooth, we're not working on the tooth. And that is just so important. Now, again, a large proximal cavity with, um, with the Reba Star. Now, again, I'm giving you a technique that I, that I, that I don't use. I'd rather use a, a sandwich technique, but again, for the, for my colleagues in America who don't like glass on the cement, uh, this is the way to go about it. So we have here this sort of large sort of uh, um, failed amalgam restoration. Um, I've taken the, uh, taken the amalgam out, removed any existing restoration, gross caries that just sort of just dust the surface with a, with a, um, with a slow speed burr, unsupported, unsupported to structure, dust around the margins. Okay, now the thing is that it's, it's always good to have a parachute when you jump out of an aeroplane. When, you, when you're using this sort of alternative techniques, it's always good to have a parachute there. So what I do, I prepare a moat and the proximal box with a number three round burr. You can see that I've done it there in the caries. So I've actually got, actually got a seal there. And that's why, again, we'll call my caries parachute. I then uh, put a matrix band on. So you etch for 15 seconds, wash and dry. Okay. Then you apply the SDF. You apply the potassium iodide. Now, this is very important. If you're triaging, you leave the potassium iodide there. If you're restoring your tooth, you've got to keep applying it uh, till you actually, the, 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 uh, the, the potassium iodide, the precipitate clears, which means you've got no free, uh, free silver there, which you can actually sort of stain that, which is going to stain the tooth. It's all bound on the silver iodide on the surface of the tooth, as you can see there. So again, either using the capsules or you can use the two little bottles. So the caries is arrested and the starts the remineralization. And that's the, you know, what a, all that stuff that we were sort of tweaking around and trying to get out, that's all gone. So the next thing we do is we actually sort of insert a layer of a resin modified glass on the cement easy over the, over the surface of the, uh, of the, uh, of the tooth and photo cure it. Now you've got the, you've got, uh, you've got Reba Bond LC, which is the best way to do it. It's a capsule. You get a, you get a pre-mixed uh, uh, power liquid ratio. You get a really nice creamy result. Uh, you can use um, you can use Reva, Reva Bond, which comes in liquid powder ratio, uh, which is uh, it's not as good because you've got to mix it. You don't get a good a mix, and you've got to guess the liquid powder ratio. You can also use Fuji Bond if you've if you've got that, um, or you can also you can use the Reva Light Cure, which is a resin modified glass on the cement that you just powder mix ratio. So any any of these any of these products work. Um, and the reason, this, this, the, other, the other benefit is if you're using a, a, a resin modified glass on a cement adhesive, you actually eliminate the polymerization shrinkage stress. And this is a paper that was published uh, back in, in 2015. There's nothing new about it. And it's just the, the big manufacturers also try and suppress this. But you can see there, that's the polymerization shrinkage stress with a whole range of products. But you've got uh, Reva, Reva Bond and Fuji Bond there you actually eliminate the stress. And if you put a second layer of the Reva Bond or Fuji down, you actually get a slightly positive result. Now, the benefit of this is that, that um, virtually in, uh, in three months time, the, the, over three months, the composite resin can keeps polymerizing and therefore it keeps shrinking slightly. And so the second layer also, also sort of prevents this, but also assures a good marginal seal. And what I, what I mean by that is that if you actually sort of uh, take a take a uh, uh, extracted tooth, put a single layer of Reva Bond down, and actually sort of bulk fill the restoration. Look at it; you get this defect there along the along the margin. Whereas if you put a second layer down and, and, and bulk fill it, the second layer you actually because it's got a slightly uh, uh, lower vis lower viscosity than the composite resin, you actually fill in the margin, so you don't get a marginal defect. So that's a, it's a, that's a this is the, the stage for another topic, but I just want to show you how to do it. And again. This is the resin modified adhesive bond under a scanicron microscopy. You can see there that this is the, there's the carious dentine. You can see there's, there's the silver iodide precipitate and you can see the, the Reva bond actually on the surface there. So again, 
whole new way of, of restoring restoring uh, restoring tea. Where the composite resin um, composite resin bonds uh, to the resin modified glass adhesive, and that eliminates the polymerization, shrinkage, test, and benefit. Now this is a, this is some case some cases. Large asymptomatic legion amalgam. Patient came in and said, "Look, there's something wrong up there. I keep getting food court." Well, hello. <laughs> so what I've done there, I've restored the tooth. Um, I've used the glass on the cement base there, and a resin, a resin modified, so resin, resin modified glass and the resin. There. You can see there again suddenly how this, this the caries are precipitating out of this. So you get this sort of you look at take an X-ray afterwards, and I sure I advise you if the first a few of these you do, take the X-ray just to convince yourself this is what's happening. Okay, there's the pre-treatment. Uh, there's, there's, there's three months after restoration. Look at that, look at that. We've actually, it's like putting iodine on a, on a cut. It just, it just helps the body, we're helping the body to heal itself. And again, look at the clinical photographs. Actually, no, no sign of that. Here's another case, each for 15 seconds, huge cavity. I mean, why she wasn't symptomatic, I don't know. Um, but again, as soon as you put the restoration in, Look at that! Look at that remineralization that's occurring there. It's just—I mean, these are the sort of things that, uh, that 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 sort of knock my socks off. Still at my age. Okay, so here's the lesion. There's the placement. Now look at that. Okay, this is this is 14, 14 months after placement. Look at that! Look at that! Look at that! It's actually the tooth has actually healed itself underneath the underneath the rebus bar. I mean, that's, the, that's truly amazing. This placement, three months, 14 months, no staining. I mean, it just, uh, it's just a, a whole new way of doing dentistry. Now, very quickly go through this. Um, again, the seminar I'm doing, I'll go through it quickly, but Reva Stars and adjunct to endodontic treatment. Um, and it, but it's uh, Jay Marita have been selling a 3.8% SPF for years for endodontic treatment. But the thing is, you can't use the full, the full bottle because it's just, uh, it's just too, uh, it's just, too, too caustic. But you can see there that they irrigate with 15% EDTA. It's a similar effect as etching. So you're actually sort of cleaning out the dentile tubules. You can see there with SDF with the pH of 13 is too caustic to use. But as soon as you put the potassium iodide on, you get a you get a tolerable um, uh, pH of nine. So you can see that's the that's the it penetrating deeply into the dentile tubules. And the antibacterial FDI actually actually sort of stops the it stops the um, uh, it kills all the bugs in the in the canal. Um, no, no matter virtually no matter what you do, so it's an adjunct to uh, to uh, Reva Star. And this is what I call a endodontic dressing. Um, I've got a university student who comes in who's just studying law. Well, they're going to they're going to be able to afford a root canal when they graduate. They come in with something like this and they can't. So here's a here's a woman who um, I tried to do a root canal, couldn't find the canal. So I've got to take the two. That she said, oh Jeff, you know, can you can you save it? I said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll put some um, put some of this Reva Star, and you see, I couldn't find the canals. And here she is, uh, three years later. Uh, this is another case. This is a, a mate of mine who was a retired a retired ENT surgeon, and um, he was complaining. He said, Oh, you dentists are a bunch of rogues. You do these root canals, and I've got to put myself on on uh, on antibiotics every three months because it blows up, and you charge all that money. I mean, coming from an ENT surgeon, charging all that money, hello. Um, and I said, Peter, do you want to be a laboratory dog? And he said, I'll be a laboratory dog. So I actually took the root, took the old root filling out. I put some GP points up there in case the, the, the canals became sclerotic. There's, you can see that carious lesion there. Here is again, you see we've gone from sort of into digital x-rays. This is it six and a half years later. He hasn't used antibiotics since I did it. So just use as a dressing. So you can see using like this, how effective this, uh, this treatment would be in endodontics. And this is, I mean, I use Reva Star more for endodontics than anything in my practice because it's a, it's a whole game changer. And there's this growing cohort of dentists who say, look, I was worried about this and said, but I can't believe it because uh, if you get, a, I think the word is, a rema separates in the canal, it doesn't break, it separates, it doesn't matter. It goes around that, you really, you really, um, that changes the whole sort of endodontic, endodontic game. So on that, uh, I hope I haven't got a, no, I think I'm still within my time frame. I'd, uh, thanks for your attention and I'm certainly happy to answer some questions later on. Uh, back to you, Lou. Thanks, Jeff. As usual, uh, walking the walk of uh, what I would say challenging our norm. And uh, I love the endo stuff. I've not seen that. So let me just ask you one quick question and then we'll get to Ron, okay? Great. Sure. So. 
in your technique in the U.S., <clears throat> we're definitely oftentimes as an adult geriatric dentist, how long do you normally find you're scrubbing the potassium iodide after you place the SDF on? How long is the scrubbing usually? Oh, you don't. I mean, you just keep, you keep applying until it disappears. If you're using it, if you're using it to restore a tooth, if you're using it to triage, yep. you put a couple of drops on and you still leave that white precipitate there because you want the silver iodide in the dental tubules. Right. But you don't want the silver. If you leave the silver iodide there, and then you, because it, if it's, if it, if it isn't bound to dentine, and you leave it there and you put a curing light on it, it'll break. It's, a, it's quite a, an unstable molecule in many respects. So you're going to get, you're going to get silver and iodide breaking out and it goes black. So therefore you want to keep applying it until all the, all the, all the silver is actually, or the silver iodide is bound onto, onto denatured protein in the carings. So tell me that moment when you know you've done a complete job of, covering or you know that silver tell me in your oh, okay. years of doing this yeah okay because you just keep applying it until it goes clear okay you've got a, you've, got a, you've got a clear liquid okay and then okay. When, you, when you when you actually go ahead with it with your triplex syringe and wash it out but you see this white liquid suddenly form now, i don't quite know what that's sort of called a reagent okay then, and then then you look at the caries and you'll see that slide i showed the caries of the caries have actually got that white sort of sort of furry white precipitate over them yep now that's the bound silver iodide on the on the on the denatured uh, collagen of the caries. Got it. Um, that's why you've got to wait for 15 seconds to get the mineral contact to expose that denatured collagen. So you're not going to get you're not going to get a um, uh, you're not going to get a, a, a staining. So Jeff, one other question that came up, and then I want to get Ron going. Um, I think you covered this because of using etch. You remove the surface bio load via etching for the 15 seconds. Is that correct? The etching does two things. <coughs> it actually gets it gets all the all the all the bio load out of the dental yep. tube. So it actually goes down. So it makes it. I mean, if you use it with silver, if you use it with silver diamond <coughs> fluoride by itself, it'd make the silver diamond fluoride probably more effective. Maybe you wouldn't have to do it twice a year. Okay. Um, but uh, uh, the but basically this is but, but as I as I'm aware nobody's talking about etching in the states. Right, it's really bizarre because it just makes the whole process. Uh, well, if you've got to etch for two reasons with the, with the Reva Star, one is to stop it from staining. Okay, that's probably the first reason. The second thing is to allow it to penetrate deeply into the tube because you're pulling out all the all the bile load. You had the blood pus in yesterday's lunch out of the dentine tubules and the, and the right. first sort of the first surface. Sorry. Well, okay, Jeff, I know it's the middle of the night there. Don't take a long nap because I'm going to bring you back for the q and I love you, baby. I'm going to bring Ron in right now. So I'm going to have you turn off your camera and I'm okay. going to get Ron to turn on his camera. Ron, you're going to unmute yourself. Thank you, buddy. And okay, so I just got to say, I'm gonna introduce Ron as really one of my brothers in dentistry. He walks the walk, he has a private practice in New York. He's one of our superior educators and uh, he's gonna take us through our hands on. So I'm gonna turn off my video and I'm gonna turn off and I'm gonna give everything to you, Ron, take it. So Lou, thanks very much. Um, I'm gonna throw a little monkey wrench kind of into what we just did because I just think it's important. And uh, it, it, it'll answer some questions as I go into the hands-on. What I'm gonna do actually is jump into just a super quick four slide PowerPoint that will kind of show us what I'm talking in the hands-on and Lou will answer the question that you just asked. So I was one of the first dentists in the US to use Reva Star about five, six years ago as SDI was trying to get into uh, into the market. And what I found unequivocally was that every time I used this product, teeth were just not sensitive anymore. So Lou, you just asked a great question and I'm gonna demo it in the video, but we don't see in the video, which is so critically important that Jeff just said, is applying Reva Star and the potassium iodide is a specific you need to follow the specific protocol when doing a restoration. So let me take you through this clinically, which we didn't say we were gonna do, but I just felt it was important. And then I'll run the video. 
here are a couple of amalgams that we were going to take out. The patient was having sensitivity after a dentist recently did this. We took them out. You see, we have totally clean, uh, clean, clean preparations. Total etched, as Jeff said, 15 seconds for the enamel and dentin. Rinse that off. I then apply Riva Star, the silver portion, right on to the tooth. It's obviously very, very clear. That's what it looks like close up. Then we, this is what happens when you apply the potassium iodide. You get this dical-like precipitate. And if you look at the second molar, you see that I, when you continue to apply the potassium iodide, so when you initially apply it, this is what happens, right onto the silver fluoride. When you continue to apply it, it turns clear. You see a couple of little remnants right here. And all you, I would have to do is put another few drops or another few micro brushes of the, the potassium iodide on here, and this would clear up. Once it's totally clear, we rinse that off. Don't get it on the tissue like I just did. You'll get a little chemical burn. You'll rinse it off. We then here applied an RMGI and then went through an adhesive process at the time, then placed our adhesive and then our composite. So bottom line was, that's how, that's how you know kind of when to stop and when to stop using that uh, potassium iodine. Now I'm gonna take you through this in a video to show you what I just did, except you won't see that precipitate because I'm working on an extracted tooth. And here, you know, in the US, we all want an adhesive technique. We want a composite on top of that restoration. So let me take you through, pretty much Jeff spoke about it. I just showed it to you, but let me take you through the video. My name is Ron Kaminer, and today I'm gonna to talk to you about Reba Star and how to use it clinically in a restorative technique. Reba Star is a silver fluoride product. For years, silver fluoride was used for caries management dating back to 1912. It fell out of favor because silver fluoride, when it arrested decay, turned teeth black. Well, lo and behold, SDI brings to the market Reba Star, a silver fluoride with potassium iodide that minimizes the ability of teeth to turn black. Now, in other countries, very often it's used in a technique where it's placed on the dentin and then a glass sound or restoration is placed over it. Here in the States, we want an aesthetic restoration. And because of that, I'm gonna show you how to use this in an adhesive technique. So we're gonna go here clinically, and this is our Reverse Star capsules, silver for the silver fluoride, green for the potassium iodide. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to total etch the preparation for a short period of time. Literally, we don't need much more than eight seconds or so, and I'm going to total etch this. I'm going to leave that on for eight to 10 seconds. While that's setting, I'm going to go ahead and just have my assistant grab her suction, and I'm going to go ahead and just rinse it off. I'm going to dry it thoroughly, and now I'm going to place my silver fluoride. So I'm going to break the capsule with the back end, and I'm going to liberally apply silver fluoride onto the dentin. Now, Reba Star acts as a desensitizing agent, an outstanding desensitizing agent, and that is technically what its FDA approval is for. Um, many people use silver fluoride for caries arrest and caries management, but technically it's a desensitizing agent. So I've applied it liberally, multiple coats on the dentin. And if I were just to rinse that off and leave it alone and put a restoration on it, the restoration would turn black. What I'm going to do now is apply potassium iodide. The potassium iodide undergoes a chemical reaction with the silver fluoride. And as it undergoes a chemical reaction, in the mouth, this will turn a dical-like color, almost yellowish. And I, when I keep applying it, it'll turn back clear. Obviously, here on the model, it doesn't do that. But in your mind's eye, you can figure what happens. So I'm putting multiple coats now of the potassium iodide. And once that's sufficiently coated, the silver fluoride, 
I'm then going to rinse that off. I'm then going to rinse that off very, very quickly. I'm going to suction that. And now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to apply last ionomer onto the dental floor. So my assistant is triturating a compule of Riva that we're going to apply onto the dentin as the base layer. And what I'm going to show you here is a tri-level restorative technique. So after we apply Riva, Riva self-cure, glass onomer onto the dentin, I'm then going to let that set, apply an adhesive on top, SDI zip bond, like you're that, let that set, and then apply flow and a final restorative. So we have a tri-level adhesive restoration that has silver fluoride underneath. Clinically, when I've done these, I can tell you that there's, very, there's little to no staining of that residual dent. So I'm going to just apply a little bit onto the dental floor. Just like so. I'm going to take a ball burnisher and I'm going to wet it just with a little bit of water. Not alcohol when we use glass on and I'm just going to tamp that down right into place. And you can kind of see that as it tamps down right onto the dentin. And now we wait, we keep it dry and we let it sit. Reva will set, the fast will set pretty quickly, well under a minute. And what I'll then do is I'll go back and I'll check with my ball burnisher every so often on the consistency. I see it's still wet, but I'll press it just down into place and we let it sit. Remember, I've total etched the preparation. So my enamel margins are etched. My dent on the floor was etched. I've now dried it. The next step that I'm going to now do, once Riva has set, is I'm going to apply zip bond to the entire preparation. Internal walls, enamel margin, and apply zip bond. So I'm going to go ahead and take my zip bond. My glass onomer is pretty well set. And I'm going to apply zip bond everywhere. Onto my internal walls onto my preparations. I'm going to apply that, really coating that dentin, really agitating it into the dental walls. I'm then going to air dry it. First slowly, and then vigorously. And then I'm going to light cure the restoration. So now we've cured our adhesive in place. I want to apply one layer of Aura Easy Flow. The beautiful thing about Easy Flow, it's, it's, it has great consistency to it. So I'm going to apply it right over my glass ionomer, small amount, running up to my dentinal walls. I don't even need to touch it. I'm going to light cure that as well. I'm then going to apply Aura right on top. I'm going to take just a ball burnisher here. I'm going to tamp it down into place. I have a little bit of wetting resin on there so materials don't stick on me. I'm going to remove all that excess. Trying to work around my videographer, it's always fun. I would be using SDI's curing light right now, but my hygienist is placing sealants and she's using the light. But I'm just gonna go ahead and finish off this restoration. the handling of that aura is really, really nice. I'm 
and we're just about through. I'm going to hit that now with the curing light. And if you follow this technique specifically, you will see that most of the time, almost all the time, you'll have absolutely no graying of the tooth, no discoloration, but you'll have a desensitized preparation and the silver fluoride will assist you in caries management. Now, of course, I could finish this off using a uh, polishing or finishing uh, carbide. And there we have our final restoration. And you understand the technique using Riva Star and Aura and Riva. So what I tried to do there is just really give you guys a laboratory, if you will, type demo but the important thing taking you back to the five slide powerpoint was on that last slide there was no graying of that restoration and that's the beautiful part lou i'm gonna pass it back to you thank you very much well don't go anywhere don't i'm go not anywhere. going okay so just a couple questions and i think it's it's really interesting and and thank you obviously for taking the time to do this video one of the questions that came in is, are we using traditional phosphoric etch? And the answer is yes, of course. Um, so that's one question. When we talk about using Riva Bond, or I'm sorry, Riva Bond, and I think we'll get Jeff more into this, it's whether we use a RMGI versus a true glass ionomer. And I think we'll bring Jeff more into this when we get into questions. But I want everybody to understand, and we keep getting these questions, why would you bother, Ron, after doing a class one or a class two, why would you bother even using SDF or Reva Star? And openly what Jeff alluded to was, you, in case you are leaving decay or you want to minimize your preparation, you don't have to be going and chasing everything. What are your thoughts? Well, listen, I, it, and that's 100% correct, but to that, and Lou, you know this, when, when we go around and, and, and Carla and we go teach dentists, no matter what, still, still what falls into one of the top complaints is I'm still getting sensitivity. And why am I getting sensitivity? Well, you can pretty well be rest assured if you put Riva Star under any restoration, you're just gonna eliminate sensitivity. So if you left that decay behind, you got that covered. You've now eliminated sensitivity when you talk about that belt and suspenders or that parachute that Jeff talked about, I think that's really what it does. It just, if that extra step, if every dentist did this on every restoration, you'd have sensitivity would never be a question with, for anybody and decay would be totally just, just stopped underneath. Right. So that's the beauty, I think. I think everybody has to understand that. Basically, we're not perfect and this allows you truly to desensitize the tooth and eradicate the decay underneath the restoration, period, end of story. That's the game changer in this. Okay, so I'm gonna get to, I wanna introduce Justin next because we're already getting questions about coding. Now, Ron, you just left. When we come back, one of the questions will be, and be prepared, why do you use a flowable after, before you put on your final hybrid composite? I have my answer. We'll get back to yours. We'll get back to that. Okay, so Justin, I want to bring you on now. So let me see your face. Okay, so Justin's new to me. He's new to catapult education. We're not going to let him go so fast. He's a clinical instructor at Tufts University. He's also obviously in private practice. He's gonna get into coding and really his, kind of his version of where SDF and Revastar are taking us. I'm gonna bow out, take it away, Justin. So like you said, thank you for the introduction. Uh, appreciate it, Lou. Um, I'm Justin Carterelli. I'm originally from Tuxbury, Mass. Studied at UNH. Um, Went to Tufts University School of Dental Medicine, got my degree in 2015, 
I have a private practice in North Andover and I'm um, an assistant professor at Tufts Dental in the Department of Clinical uh, Comprehensive Care. So uh, I always kind of start off uh, with this slide from the ADA in 2017. Uh, at the time, there were 78% of dentists that have never used silver diamine fluoride. Uh, it's been a few years since the study. I mean, I believe we still are in 2020, but I lose track with the kind of groundhog day life that we're all living for the time being. Um, of course, this study inherently only includes practitioners that were registered with the ADA and those that took the survey, but it does show that SDF has been severely underutilized in uh, dental practices. This breakdown is uh, ICDAS, which is the International Carriers Detection and Assessment System. Uh, Tufts Department of Comprehensive Care has these posters up in every clinic at the school. Um, we have monthly email contests for the faculty and students to identify the different stages of caries and um, cavitated and uncavitated lesions. Our new department chair is, uh, has a background in cariology, so she's, she's very interested in bringing and introducing these minimally invasive uh, techniques into the dental school. Uh, this is actually the first year that I'll have a dedicated lecture for the incoming class on silvodiamine fluoride as part of their first semester curriculum. Um, just to break it down a little bit, I don't want to get into too much detail. Um, but ICDAS zero is sound enamel. Uh, one would be uh, first the first visual changes you see when when teeth are dry, so your brown spot or white spot lesions. Two are the distinct visual changes that you uh, see in enamel when the enamel is wet. Uh, radiographically, these kind of show up as E zero, which is no radiolucency. E one radiolucency limited into that first layer of enamel. Um, E2 or carries extended to the DEJ and then D1 which is carries involving dentin minimally. Those are kind of those board lesions that you'd look for uh, when you're trying to graduate dental school and you wanted something that was your ideal prep kind of layup scenario. Uh, IC-3 is actual localized enamel breakdown. So these are the beginning of actual cavitated lesions. Um, IC-4 is underlying dark shadow from the infected dentin. And these radiographically show up uh, are considered D2, and we're seeing those two distinct triangles now extending into the middle third of the dentin. Lastly is IC-5 and IC-6, which five is a cavitated enamel with dentin cl clinically visible. Uh, and six is extensive cavitation covering more than half the surface with visible dentin. Those are D3, are considered D3, and it's radiographically extending into the inner one third of the, of the dentin and approaching the, uh, approaching the pulp. Um, this is kind of the protocol we follow at the school. Uh, they developed this 4D system for caries management. The first D is determine. You want the history of the patient, um, take a Canberra caries assessment, uh, management by risk assessment. Two is detect. So you're utilizing that ICDAS uh, poster or that ICDAS table to classify the carry stage. Three is decide. So what you want to do based on the patient's history and their caries level. Um, if it's E0, E1, can you just have a discussion about home care, improving their oral health? Um, is it something that maybe it's a little more advanced and you wanna start introducing topical fluoride at every visit, every recare, maybe making them custom fluoride delivery trays or pH management to improve their uh, oral environment? You know, or are we now are we talking into SDF or do you wanna do a GI or a smart restoration? Is it something that's traditional drill and fill? Um, and then the important one is four. Uh, you want to do the treatment that you decide on. Um, I'm not a big fan of watches. I mean, I use them in my clinical practice. You put a watch on a tooth, um, but you want to make sure that you're, you're doing something, even if that, you know, watch, that something that you're doing is just, okay, hey, oral hygiene instruction, going over something. I don't want to tell a patient, yeah, we're just going to watch it and watch it get worse. Let's watch it, but let's have a plan of something that you can do at home or we can do here that can kind of make it a little bit, um, a little bit better and just not sit there and watch it get worse. Um, this is an article from the Journal of Dental Research. It's a study of non-invasive treatments. So looking at the effectiveness of sealants, sodium fluoride, um, and SDF on non-cavitated and cavitated lesions. Um, the take home here is that although fluoride varnish and sealants work to varying degrees on minimally or non-cavitated lesions, uh, SDF was found to be the most effective treatment for advanced cavitated lesions of any surface. Another article that was presented to us at, uh, at Tufts from the Journal of Dental Research. Um, it's the reasons as, as we, for, for us dentists not doing things. Uh, and it can be narrowed down to kind of these three reasons. 
and it's don't know, and that can be due to general ignorance or lack of access to high quality evidence-based guidance. Uh, can't do uh, from a lack of confidence in performing new procedures uh, or access to materials needed to perform the procedure. And then the, the most frustrating one is won't change. And that could be due to the level of comfortability with previous treatment methods or distrust of evidence-based research. I see that a lot at Tufts. There are a lot of doctors that have not been practicing clinical dentistry for a long time. So they aren't comfortable with some of the newer techniques. Um, so I think it's important that we're bringing a lot of those techniques in, not just for the students, but for a lot of the doctors too, to, to see how we can utilize SDF or glass ionomers in our practices today to, to benefit our patients. Um, you know, we always have trouble accepting new things, uh, but silver technically is not, not that new in the field of medicine, just to go over a little history of silver and silver diamine fluoride. Uh, you know, there's been so many instances of, of silver being used in the medical field for years. Um, it was a cauterizing agent in the medicine for treating wounds, especially burn wounds. Um, it was big in, in World War I for, for treatment on the battlefield. Um, silver night for the new, newborn babies. Silver nitrate kind of became subsidiary when penicillin and other antibiotics were introduced in the 50s, but silver in general has been used for a very long time in medicine and specifically in dentistry as well. Um, we all should know the guy here from our first year dental courses, uh, G.V. Black, the master of our extension for prevention preps, um, or as one of my colleagues likes to call it, extension for destruction with the, with the amalgams. Um, you know, the, even GV Black kind of saw the, the writing on the wall for preventative dentistry. Um, back in the early part of the 20th century, GV W. D. Miller and Percy Howe utilized silver nitrate to arrest carious lesions. Looking at the names, GV, WD, I think I'm going to start going by JJ Cartarelli if I ever want to make it into the dental history books. So we'll work on that on my next lecture for the introduction. Um, GV Black lectured 130 years ago and stated at that time, the day is surely coming and perhaps within the lifetime of you young men before me when we will be engaged in practicing preventative rather than reparative dentistry. So that was 130 years ago. And the man that created these, you know, GV black preps that we use for all of our amalgams with the undercuts and everything knew that there was going to be a paradigm shift, shift in dentistry where we were going to be working more for preventative rather than reparative. And uh, I think it was, it was Ron or Jeff that said, you know, we're not working on the tooth, we're working with the tooth. Um, this ADA article from June 1939, which I was like minus 48 when it came out. So uh, it was a quite a long time ago, but even then they're showing, you know, they're mentioning compounds of silver being used for dental ther therapy for more than a century, already at that point, more than a century. Um, its use was recognized in 1846. Percy Howe had his Howe solution in 1917 that was silver, water, and ammonia that they were using, which are three of the main components of silver diamine fluoride. I mean, obviously we've added the fluoride, but that house solution was a precursor to, to SDF today. Getting into some of the you know clerical stuff of, of how to utilize it in your practice and who can apply and coding and things like that. For who can apply, I mean, it's different state to state. The link on the bottom there, um, and I'll try to share these slides later, um, but the link on the bottom there uh, we'll bring you to a breakdown of, of, you know, state by state who can apply at your practice, you know, the it kind of really focuses on the hygienists um, and kind of what level of supervision they need to apply. Um, states vary with general supervision, direct, indirect, or through telehealth, where the hygienist is maybe off site and the dentist is supervising, um, which I think in, in today's world is, is something that's, you know, we're going to see more of um, public health supervision or without supervision at all. Um, basing on the areas, again, I'm from North Andover, Massachusetts, uh, so I kind of have, you know, my, my references and my contacts are all through these areas. So from what I've heard in, in the kind of New England area, for Maine, hygienists, all hygienists can apply and EFDAs can apply. Uh, Massachusetts hygienists and EFDAs can apply. New Hampshire hygienists and as recently as 2019, no assistants were um, allowed to apply silver diamine fluoride yet in New Hampshire. Um, again, this is something that I think is constantly changing as with the coding and the insurance reimbursement. Um, so we always got to kind of keep a close eye on it. Um, but the last um, kind of checks that I had, this was, this was the, uh, the current regulations. As far as coding goes, um, 
the most prominent code I use is D1354, uh, 1354. It's interim carries arresting medicament application, and it's a per tooth code. Um, it's conservative treatment of an active non-symptomatic lesion by topical application of carries arresting or inhibiting medicament and without mechanical removal, removal of sound tooth structure. Um, this is kind of the code that I use in my practice uh, pretty frequently. Um, it's a per tooth procedure. Uh, some treated teeth will require reapplication, um, and some will be followed to exfoliation, as is the case in, the case in, in, in baby teeth. You know, you may put SDF on it uh, to, to placate that, that tooth until it's ready to come out, and then that kid never needs to get a needle, never needs to get a shot, and he's happy to come back and see you. Um, and others will require definitive restoration, as in like a smart technique or something that Jeff was presenting on. Reapplication on the same tooth within the current year's plan may be included in the initial claim, but a lot of times um, you're not going to see reimbursement on the second application uh, if you see reimbursement on the first application at all. A subsequent restorative procedure may be needed at some time or at time um, after application of a carries medicament. That reimbursement may vary by plan depending on when the final restoration is placed. That being said, you know some plans will have a 90 day waiting period where you can put this medicament on, but you have to wait 90 days before you'll get reimbursed for a final restorative treatment. Um, in some cases, if you want to place the restoration that day, me personally, I've been just billing for the restoration because you're gonna get a higher reimbursement on that. Um, for children, most of these insurances will cover um, SDF application per tooth. Um, there are limits per years depending on the print um, on the plan. Um, for adults, again, this is just from my personal at my practice, what I've submitted, what I've seen come back. Uh, Cigna, no direct coverage, but there is a network contracted fee. Delta of Mass, um, not covered. Patient, I usually will pay out of pocket for that. Um, Delta of New Hampshire is covered twice per tooth in a 12 month period, but restorations performed on that same tooth. Um, within 90 days are, are denied. So again, those are kind of the ones that if I'm doing a smart restoration, I'm probably either you know, directly billing the patient for the SDF after I explain the benefits and everything to them, but then submitting for the restoration. Um, Guardian actually has pretty good coverage. They cover it about 70%. My fee at my practice is about $112. Um, Mass Health, uh, which this we've learned from the school because at Tufts Dental, we see a lot of Mass Health patients. They are now covering um, one application of SDF per tooth per calendar year. And MetLife, the network fee is about $17 and it's covered at 12. Again, these are just my personal experiences going through my, my practice. Um, it might be different for you depending on what you practice and depending on what insurances you take, of course. Fewer insurances recognize or reimburse this code for adults right now, but as more of us begin using it and begin providing the service, uh, I think more insurance companies will follow. Um, uh, getting into some, I think I saw a question about other codes that, that might be um, used. Um, these are some other codes that I've used with varying degrees of success. Um, D1208 is a topical application of fluoride excluding varnish, which technically silver diamine fluoride is a topical application of fluoride. Um, a D9910 is application of desensitizing medicament per report. And then the D1999, of course, all the, the nines, those unspecified protocols, the unspecified preventative procedure by report. Again, the important thing is to um, check with your coding advisors on, on these and, and see you know, which ones may get you the most reimbursement um, for your plans. Uh, how I, I guess I should say how I bill, not how to bill, but how I bill, um, you know, you're not going to support your practice with SDF placement, but you are going to get grateful patients, uh, you'll build trust and you'll be doing a service to the patients and they'll appreciate it. Um, the insurance companies aren't great on reimbursement, reimbursement like now, like I kind of showed, you know, you can get, you can take up to $90 write-offs if you're getting reimbursed at all, but you know, I'm trying to prognosticate towards the future. Um, reimbursements will improve. And if we can get used to placing it and have it as part of our practice and be comfortable using it, then when those reimbursements improve, we'll kind of be able to hit the ground running or you'll be able to hit the ground running because it's already a part of your practice. Um, I'll kind of start with the initial visit. I'll have my consent forms. Um, we'll get our initial radiographs, which you of course can bill for. And then the SDF application uh, one to three weeks follow-up. And again, this is kind of how I do it and how Tufts does it. 
uh, one, one to three week follow up, reapply the SDF uh, if needed. You can check the lesion, see if everything's been arrested. You look for this matte black kind of um, surface that feels rough. If you, if you kind of tap on it with a perio probe, I don't use an explorer too, too much on it just because I don't want to um, cause any damage. I'll use a perio probe just to get a feel. Um, and then you can put your protective restoration, uh, GI or smart restoration on top of it. At the three month follow up, you can take a follow up radiograph um, and then if a final restoration if you want it. And, and something like that is, you know, occasionally in my practice, I'll, I'll cut back a GI and then veneer over with a composite um, if I want some more strength. But a lot of times the glass ionomers um, hold up pretty well. Uh, if you wanted to do it all in one visit, which I do a lot of that too, uh, the initial visit, same thing with the consent form, initial radiograph, and then you do your smart uh, restorative technique and, and I'll use the SEFKI for that um, with the GI restoration, kind of like what, what Jeff was showing earlier, Dr. Knight was showing earlier. Um, you can build a patient directly for the SDF and then submit for the restoration plane uh, placed. Uh, you can use the protective restoration, the D2940, um, or you could submit for a final restoration as you normally would with the surface and location. I mentioned the consent form. Um, I think it's important. Uh, we use it at Tufts. We have to use it at Tufts. I mean, the kids at Tufts have to get a consent form for, for everything. I mean, there's pretty much a three hour appointment dedicated to consent forms and medical history there. Um, but I still think it's important and I use it in my private practice. Um, I think it's important with children uh, so that the parents see it and they know what the, you know, they're gonna be more upset probably if you, you change the color of a tooth on a kid or burn the gingiva on a kid. Um, so I'll have them go over this. I'll go over it with them. I'll mark the teeth that we're going to do, have the patient or parent sign, um, kind of explain everything. The key here, you know, it's gingival staining or gingival burning, um, maybe slight discomfort of the gums, the metallic taste, you know, possible risk of not arresting all the decay and having to do something different, uh, and then the color change. So the main thing is, is definitely make sure that the consent forms are in color, whether you're doing it digitally um, or if you're printing it out, don't print it out. And, black and white or grayscale because they're not going to really be able to appreciate any color change. And as, as we were taught in dental school, always, you know, under promise and over deliver. My consent form has the advantage dressed only SDF kind of image of, of the, the dark color change that can occur. Um, but hopefully I'm looking for, uh, for something more like on the right where using my SDF and KI, there is no color change after. Um, again, reason for the consent form, this was just on a patient I didn't kind of put enough Vaseline enough petroleum jelly on the on the gums there, uh, so I got a little bit of that SDF on the on the soft tissue. After about 60 seconds, you see you know, that white lesion starting to show up. Kind of blot it dry. That white tissue kind of sloughs off. Um, and there's just a little raw area there. Um, one week follow up, you ask the patient about it. You know, oh, it was a little sore or a little tender for about a day, but then I didn't really notice it. Mouth heals fast. That's why gums heal fast. That's why being a periodontist is nice too. Um, so it's it's not a huge deal, but again, it's just something you want them to know going into it. So I think the uh, the consent form is important there. Just to go over a little bit of uh, my setup here, um, you know, depending adult child, it's about the same setup. You want patient eyewear, patient bib. Maybe the adult doesn't get the cool giraffe sunglasses; they get the regular sunglasses. Depending on the adult, um, SDF of choice uh, with your brush tip applicators and disposable dapping dishes, cotton rolls, two by twos, petroleum jelly. If it's a kid, sometimes I'll use scented lip balm um, because there's an ammonia smell to it, uh, and you can kind of place that on their lips instead, and that'll kind of they'll smell that rather than smell the ammonia. Uh, a gingival barrier. Again, you can use a rubber dam if you want. I, I usually don't. Um, I think with the cotton roll isolation and everything, you're, you're pretty good, but there's obviously no contraindication to using a rubber dam with this. Um, a bite block to prevent closing while it's setting. Mirror, explorer, and spoon excavator, and then super floss, topical fluoride if I want to place it on after. Again, it helps a little bit with the taste of ammonia if, if I'm just doing the SDF. And then a final rest, uh, restoration material if I'm doing a smart technique or something, uh, I'll use a, a, a self-care glass ionomer. Um, the super floss, if it's a proximal lesion, sometimes the super floss is nice because it's a little puffy and you can kind of soak up some of that SDF, floss it through and kind of drag it without having to snap the floss down and cause splash or anything like that. So that works pretty well on interproximal uh, lesions. Um, you guys are going to get a lot of cases today, so I'll kind of go through this one. There's one at the end I want to show you, but this was just a, a, a tooth that was previously restored in 2015 with glass ionomer, lost some more recurrent decay. The tooth was asymptomatic. Um, 
you place it. The, the key thing on these ones that I just wanted you guys to see was just the, the glass ionomer and kind of my technique on it. Um, like the old Ron Cohen infomercials with the with his with his rich history up and it's you kind of set it and forget it right I, I place my G on uh, GI on there kind of fill it like an ice cream cone I don't really manipulate it that much for you know about 30 seconds after after mixing kind of just get it to where it needs to be and then I don't touch it after 35 seconds I'm, I'm done touching that I let it set for about two and a half minutes you can always cut it back with a, a um a hand piece and a burr after it's not like amalgam where you don't really want to touch it with a burr right after it sets um so just get it on there who cares how it looks and then you can cut it back after um the way i look at it is you wouldn't you know cement a crown on with a gic with a glass iron or cement and then for two minutes kind of move that crown around or have the patient biting and chewing on it um if you wanted that bond to be strong uh, and the same kind of goes for glass iron or just kind of let it sit there let those bonds form don't continually break and and and, and make those bonds um, by manipulating the, the material a lot while it's setting. And then again, a little bit of staining there. This was prior to Riva Star. This was just um, SDF. Three month post op, as Dr. Knight showed, you see some, some increase um, in remineralization in those teeth, which is really cool to see. Uh, this case I just included because I think um, it's a little bit of an interesting way for people to see different ways you can kind of use SDF. This was a new elderly patient that uh, came to me with a four unit bridge from eight to 11 that was previously cemented with temp bond uh, and it was always removed and cleaned at every visit. She was seeing a prosthodontist that was up the hallway and retired. And when you kind of walked away, he just said, go down the hall, go see everybody there. <laughs> Um, but patient presents me for the first time. She has some decay under the lingual margin of number 10 abutment. You can see the Explorer there kind of going underneath the margin. I can feel it's soft under there. So I know there's decay. Uh, it's my first time seeing her. So I got the typical, you know, my old dent and I, it was about two years ago now. So I looked even younger. Um, so <laughs> I get the, uh, my old dentist never saw anything wrong. You're a young doc. You just want to pay off your loans. You know, I don't need to replace this bridge. Um, so she's really not even gonna let me touch it uh, or treatment plan it. So I said, all right, let's, you know, we'll take it off because you're used to having it come off and then cement it back on well, just so we can take a look under there. I don't want you to lose these teeth. Um, if the decay doesn't look too bad, I have some stuff that I can put on there and that can halt the cavity from getting deeper and I can seal it back up for you. Um, I did let her know, hey, if it's too deep or there's something going on down there and it's hopeless, like, you know, we might have some other treatment options there, but I think this might be something that'll work for you. Um, it's just her perio charting, um, those teeth, uh, on this bridge act as abutments for a maxillary partial denture and that denture fits comfortably for her. So this bridge is kind of a, a linchpin for, uh, for her entire aesthetic and functional smile. Um, perio charting, some fours and fives, but no bleeding, probing, on probing, or any mobility on any of the teeth. Everything tested normal. Um, you know, a lot of them had root canals and she was an elderly patient. So there was some calcifications and things like that. But, um, that's her FMX. She wears a max partial and a mandibular partial. Uh, you can see other decay in, in, in some other spots too. Uh, and I can get to that later. But uh, she comes in for the first appointment. Um, I remove the bridge, uh, cemented with temp on. There's slight facial caries on number eight. Uh, that abutment has a nice amalgam core there. Uh, the caries on 10, you can see that's where the significant caries were where I was getting the explorer up underneath. It's along the distal lingual. Um, number 11, minimal decay, maybe a little bit there on the distal palatal. Um, facial views of, of 10 and 11. Again, the decay was really on that, that lingual of number 10. Um, I clean off, you know, debris and, and some soft carries, just spoon excavator, but I'm not digging too hard because you want to leave some of that there because that's what you're going to get the strength from. That's what's going to remineralize. That's where that, you know, hydroxy appetite is going to turn into floor appetite and you're going to get the strength. Um, I apply, you know, SDF that that first visit, um, you can see the, the, you know, number eight, where there was minimal carries that turned really dark, just based on that, that dentin must have been pretty denatured and, and there must have been some, some stuff going on there, but I had it. So I applied it to all the teeth, all three of them, um, scrubbed it on, left it for a minute, kind of moved on. Um, blotted it dry, re-cemented her temp. Um, 
with temp on and told her, okay, we're going to bring you back. I'm going to take a look at it. I might reapply. I might finalize. Um, I just want to see what the, uh, what the carries look like. Second appointment, she comes back in. You can see the darkening of the tooth structure, letting me know that some of that, you know, the SDF was working. Um, everything felt pretty sound, but I just said, hey, let me apply again. Let me put another coat of SDF on there. Um, I did a second application, uh, re-cemented the temp again, and then had her come back one more time in about one to three weeks. At that time, everything felt really solid, looked great. Uh, I felt comfortable moving on to a more final, um, more final, restoration. Uh, I kind of did a little smart technique on number 10, just to kind of fill that gap where the, the true cavity was that needed to be filled. Plus placed my self cure glass ionomer, my Riva HP has a little bit more body. I like using that um, to seal number 10. Um, and I talked to the patient and I said at this time, you know, I think the decision would be good to use a glass ionomer cement in this case, because you're going to kind of remineralize and regenerate and kind of boost that SDF that's there too. Uh, she was a little concerned about using a final cement on it, but I kind of told her, I said, you know, if something goes wrong again on this, we're gonna have to look at alternate treatments and, and you know, I don't know if we can save this bridge for, for that long. Um, and this benefit, the benefit from the fluoride from the glass animal cement, I think is gonna really, really help her. Uh, so she understood, uh, we final cemented the bridge. Uh, it's been almost two years, everything's sealed, no symptoms, no recurrent decay. Um, she's been back in for several other restorative appointments. You might've seen some of the, the cavities that needed to be taken care of. Um, in her FMX uh, and she's she's very, very happy that she found another dentist that she feels comfortable with and that she can trust. So it's just kind of probably my most interesting case with SDF, um, but it kind of shows you just uh, how it's another tool in your tool belt and it may not be a cure all for everything, um, but you can find a way to use it in your practice and a way to use it to benefit the patients in your practice. Um, that is it for me. Uh, thank you. Don't go away. I'm not going anywhere. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. So a couple fun questions. Don't, yeah. don't move your screen. So let's say I'm going to, I want to go out there. If I can have Jeff Knight on later, which he will be, he'll wake up soon. Let me ask you this, Justin. So yep. let's say, why wouldn't you, you take off an old bridge. Why wouldn't you use this almost as a carry seeking agent that you would paint the tooth rinse it, let's just say, place it on, put your potassium iodide on it, and anywhere that stains, you know now you have caries and it's effectively treating the caries. Walk me through why we wouldn't use this as today's uh, carry seeking agent. Your uncle, well, go ahead. What did, I, what did I say earlier? Can't do, won't change, something like that. That's that's pretty much the reason. You know, I've had that question before with, well, why don't we place this, place this on, you know, every crown or underneath every crown that we're going to do and use it just like you said, as it carries indicating dye almost. Um, and that's kind of what I did here. You know, I, I said I had those other abutments open. I said, let's put it on there and see what's going on. And that, that, that shocked me. Number eight looked like there was minimal carries there and that thing turned jet black and really remineralized, you know, you know, that's remineralizing that tooth, that tooth structure. Um, so I think it's, I think it's a good idea, especially, you know, in an elderly patient like this, that, that was okay. She has these, these crowns or bridges and, and I want to hold them for as long as I can. Um, so I, I, I do that quite frequently. So I guess a follow-up and we'll get Jeff on later is let's say you, you did that technique and there's some stain. And now after you've done the stain, if you prepped a little bit of that away, and let's say there wasn't room to put an RMGI or a GI over it, I think for me, the key is, is I'd probably then want to use a cement that had an RMGI base, such that Jeff had said, you really don't bond well to a treated surface. So why not use that an RMGI cement? Just, I'm asking you because I don't know. Exactly. That's well. That's what I did. So this patient had her, had her. She, her previous prosthodontist was temping it on with temp bond every time. So right. they could tell. And I said, look, I put all this SDF, all this silver diamine fluoride that that is that uses this fluoride to remineralize your tooth. If I use a cement like a glass ion or cement, RMGI cement that is going to continually give off fluoride, you're just going to reap the benefits of it even more. Um, and that's the exact you know protocol. It just makes sense, right? You're just adding fluoride into the situation. Um, so yeah, and, and I'd love to hear what, what Dr. Knight has to say about it too, because uh, I think it's, it's, it's worked really well for me. I love it. So let me ask you, there's just some quick questions. Can you give the extra procedures and materials? So is there an additional code? In other words, are you coding it out separately like SDF 
and then a one surface composite in your smart technique as an example? Yeah, so it depends. So you have to really, in mine, a lot of mine was trial and error, error. A lot of mine was doing stuff and not getting paid for it and realizing, okay, how can we manipulate this a little bit? Um, because there are some places that don't cover it all. Some insurance companies that don't cover it all. Some insurances that'll cover it, but then they won't cover a restoration to go over it for 90 days. And if I want to put a restoration over it, I'd rather get, you know, the the reimbursement for that restoration than the $12 that this company might give me for, for SDI um, or SDF for, for placing that. So you have to kind of pay attention to what the rules are for your insurance company and then, and then look at it that way. A lot of times I think it will change in the future. I think we are, cause I'm starting to see some changes. So I'm, like the guardian thing is new. Them covering it 70% is new. I, that wasn't happening last year. Um, the mass health thing is new. That wasn't happening. I mean, the, the consent form that Tufts still uses says mass health doesn't cover it. And I have to correct them every time. Um, so it's changing. So you just need to pay attention and, and keep an eye on that. So one question, and this came from Ron. Why not bill SDF as an indirect pulp cap? Technically, you kind of are doing an indirect pulp cap and insurance companies often pay for that. Why not try that? You could, I haven't, um, you know, my, and I guess my, I, I don't know enough about SDFs. You know, I've seen some of the, the, the research showing the seepage of the silver into the pulp and it was all, it was on extracted teeth. So I don't know enough about the, you know, SDF being almost approved as a pulp, you know, as something like that. And, and I would want to know more about it. So again, I, I might talk to Dr. Knight about it. Um, but no, I think that would be a, a possibility. Um, has Ron done it in the past and gotten reimbursed? I mean, well, we'll ask Ron, because in a sense, whether you're putting a liner down or using this, to me, you are doing, if you put a base down, you are actually doing an indirect pulp cap, no matter what. So I kind of think it's, I hate insurance companies. We're spending the time. We should be in reimbursed more for what we're doing. That's how I look at it. We'll take two minutes and we're gonna get right back to it. So two minutes, everybody. Justin, we'll see you soon. Thanks, bro. Thank you. Janine, I'm gonna hand it over to you and let you do your thing. So my name is Jeanine Weiss. Uh, I am a board certified pediatric dentist and a dental anesthesiologist that have been practicing in the world of pediatrics since 2002, but I got my anesthesia license before that. And I work with a lot of special needs individual. I'm currently at Jamaica Hospital. It's a trauma one uh, hospital that uh, we started our pediatric residency training program three years ago. And I believe very strongly in uh, behavior management, which uh, about the same time frame I learned and the ADA was really sort of pushing uh, silver diamine fluoride. So we, we went along that line uh, and my residents really genuinely learn a lot with the, two, with the two prep system. We did a little bit of research on it. Um, I don't know how to move my screen, so. How do I do, how do I move? You would just advance your screen in presentation mode. Okay, let's see. Just go to presentation. I'm gonna to go to presentation, uh, you... participant QA. I'm sorry for, for the delay. Let's go slide. Uh, it does not, I am really, this. I'm new to, to Zoom, so. I'll skip over. So we, so we usually, we prep our things a little differently. Thanks to COVID, we really started using a lot of silver diamine fluoride. There is over uh, a year wait uh, for our patients to really get into the operating room. And they really range in various ages. Most of the insurances that we work with uh, work with minorities. So they are capitation plans. Um, our kids usually come in with a tremendous amount of work that need to be done. Uh, and, and to do behavior management in order to educate the parent, my residents are working together on those that are usually under, under a year that may actually have uh, the start of early childhood lesions starting as soon as these teeth are erupting because the parents really don't grasp the significance of the biofilm and the diet that they're on. 
So uh, they set up the tray. We usually have one. We usually have, you see my three residents are all gowned appropriately. This is a non-aerosol procedure. Then we take the patient from the parent. We make sure that we secure it so the patient can't, is not really all that combative. Uh, little ones we swaddle. Uh, older ones we do have my favorite thing, which is a surfboard. And we go from there. Uh, it takes about five or 10 minutes. We usually make sure that everything is done. We isolate with cotton rolls. We also use the two by two gauze to make sure that everything is nice and dry. I like isolation as best as possible. Uh, remember these are moving targets. And so uh, the more we minimize the less chance for any sort of chemical burn whatsoever, the children, they scrub. We will actually, because it's 20 teeth and these lesions are can range in various sizes, we can actually use uh, one, this, what you see on the tray is actually what we can use for all four quadrants, depending on the size of the lesions. So we, this is them and this is how they go through it and they mix and match. Let's make a hospital and we move forward. So we, we are really, now as an anesthesiologist, I don't have any problem with understanding the significance of what our anesthesia can do for us. I really genuinely do not like I don't like post-traumatic stress-related issues with anybody who comes into the world of dentistry. Uh, sedation has a tendency to be extremely traumatic for my residents, as well as it is for my parents. The more monitors you have, the increase in terms of stress level. So what we will do is we will have a patient that'll sit down on a knee-to-knee -knee sort of situation. And as you can see, we have children, this particular child's mouth is in various stages with different style lesions. And this is considered to be severe. Um, by the time we get the child through pre-authorization with their, with insurance companies, with booking OR time, with booking pre-surgical testing, with making sure they're COVID negative, the earliest turnaround we've actually had is, oh, it takes about two to three months in which a lesion such as what you're seeing here can actually become significantly more advanced. So as you can see, we have already painted this particular child once and this child has come back for a recall. And so we will take notoriously take a look and see where they're at. If they're asymptomatic, we're ecstatic. Uh, it gives us chance to do behavior management in a chair rather than doing it in the operating room. When, when a kid is basically going to preschool, gives us more of an opportunity to train them so that when they see my senior colleagues or general dentists or those that like to dabble in the world of special needs, uh, I give them a healthier patient. You know, I am very, very, very cognizant. Then you see my residents after they basically, if we are able to stabilize something, it means that we're doing less pulp therapy in the OR and less extractions, which means better space maintenance. So it's extremely cost effective. Our insurance companies as of July were willing to reimburse us with the code of 1354. Uh, they will allow us to go and bring a child back, but we code it differently. It's usually a follow-up visit. We code it differently for the follow-up visit in two weeks. We do quarterly in which we will go in, in three months time, uh, use the code for varnish, because that's when we usually go and check to see if we have any additional lesions and decide whether or not these lesions are arrested with a perio probe, not an explorer, and uh, to see if a different application needs to be done. If we can wait uh, the nine months, especially during a pandemic shutdown, we are ecstatic. We really don't like a child to go in or the parent to really have to worry about things progressing. Because when you sit there and when, when our parents are sitting there and doing a knee to knee like they were in the last slide before we did COVID protocols and they would see what we saw, they would, and many times we'd wind up with our parents crying because they are not brushing the teeth and they didn't realize how bad things were. So for my residence education and with according to current guidelines, um, as per the ADA and the AAPD, they are required to know when we would do this, why we would do this. And having the honor of working in a hospital that is dealing with, uh, that has on the routine over 140 different dialects spoken, there's an increase acceptance when things don't turn black but a parent understands that we, and we use them to train them that if they see the lesion getting darker, that it's working. So it works as a really great and effective sort of educational tool for my parents. 
as well as for my residents. And I've had one resident that uh, did a study about doing it approximately and arresting it. And she found out it was really very effective because those are kind of difficult lesions to get to. And we really, if we can get to it and the child does not have a traumatic experience, they wind up being a really genuinely effective patients later on. And I've been in dentistry long enough to know that if you treat things correctly, we can actually increase the dental uh, coverage, both as a hygienist assistant. I've had several of them both come in back to my office because I also work in private practice as an assistant, then as a hygienist and a few of them that have actually applied to dental school. So it's effective in that particular guard. And we do, we absolutely do smart dentistry on those that are, uh, that are six years of age and older that can sit and tolerate the chair time and leaning back. And we also use a little bit of laughing gas if we need to but doing it atraumatically is exactly where we're going for. So I hope this was genuinely helpful for everybody. Thanks, Janine. So Janine, let me just ask you one quick question. And Justin talked about this. Interproximal prevention. Tell me what you're doing, because I obviously believe when you drill, you've drilled the tooth and it's always going to need required requirements thereafter, maintenance. How are you applying this interproximally? We're actually using that beautiful orthodontic floss, that really okay. thick floss. Yep. Uh, we actually thread through with a needle threader and we will actually use a thicker portion that had been dipped in the silver diamine fluoride and we will actually pull it up and sort of the same way you do interproximal stripping, right. we will actually go and pull the floss through the tooth to apply it directly to that area. Those, yeah. those are a little bit more, we follow it up with a, you know, in like three months with another x-ray to make sure that things are working out okay. But again, we can use a consulting fee as a specialist to make sure that they're that we're arresting the lesion. I love it. I, I mean, I love it, especially in caries prone patients. What a great way of avoiding the burr. Yeah, that's a great pearl today from Justin and you. So thank you. My pleasure. Uh, thank you. Of course, don't go far because we're going to have our Q&A after Carla. OK, sounds great. Thank you so much. I'll let you turn off your webcam and now it's time for uh, our final and absolutely wonderful speaker, Carla Cohn. Carla Cohn is a general dentist, but she really practices only pediatric dentistry. God bless her. I can't stand kids. She's the opposite. Um, she practices in Canada. She is a part-time clinical instructor at a nearby dental school in Manitoba, and I I'm just going to turn it over because there's so many questions about the SMART technique. Carla, take it over and I'll see you after you present. Okay. Thank you all so much. So SDF and Redefining Dentistry, this is pediatric dentistry for and from the general practitioner. So just a couple of things to point out on this slide. I am uh, Carla Cohn. And if you want to get hold of me, that is my email address underneath my website, drcarlacohn.com. You all know about the Catapult Education website because you're on it right now. And aap.org is the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry website that's got a lot of uh, resources for you to look at if you're interested in pediatric dentistry, which I hope you all are. And my Instagram account at Kids Dentist Carla. So please follow me. I love my followers. Thank you to SDI for the educational support provided by this uh, for this webinar. And of course, thank you to Catapult Education for hosting the webinar and uh, everything that you do for me and everybody else. Kids' teeth, they are so important. This just breaks your heart. Kids' teeth matter. And sometimes seeing kids is a bit of a challenge. And sometimes we have to do our best and pull a little bit of magic. And if we can use our Revastar, that is a little bit of magic that we've got for sure. So the behavior of our child is paramount to how we are going to be able to treat our child. The behavior is actually uh, assessed as a risk assessment. So risk assessment tool for behavior 
because one thing is what is ideal to do and the other thing is what is possible to do. So that risk assessment tool for behavior will help us to determine what our treatment options are. And these days, coronavirus also will determine what our treatment options are because we, of course, want to minimize the aerosolization of our patients' uh, dental procedures. Dental literature shows us that many dental procedures will produce aerosols and droplets that are contaminated with bacteria and blood that has viruses in that aerosolization. And that is a representing a potential route for disease transmission. So the less aerosolization that we can do, the better. And that brings us to the era of some minimally invasive dentistry, which quite honestly, we should all have been doing a long, long time ago. And it's taken perhaps a pandemic globally for us to realize that we should be doing this. I know I feel awful every time I cut into a tooth. So if we can not use that handpiece, then it is just so much better. So when we're looking at those kids that we cannot get into their mouths or we're looking at those kids that have particularly very deep lesions, we want to look at something called alternate caries management. And this is a directly from the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry verbatim from their policy uh, on SDF. So the alternate caries management that we look at when we're seeing is seeing kids is for the treatment of carious lesions that would traditionally require surgical intervention. You know, that drill and that fill, remove that diseased tooth structure, follow it by placement of a restorative material of your your choice, amalgam, composite, whatever, whatever you have, glass ionomer to restore form and function. But we know that we have barriers to traditional restorative treatment, whether those are caused by our coronavirus pandemic now, or whether that's caused by behavioral issues due to the age of a child being pre-cooperative or uncooperative, limited cooperation limited access to care. Maybe they have trouble getting into that operating room situation where we've got long wait, wait lists, as, as Janine had said, financial issues that will prevent a patient from following through with treatment. And so we need to look at alternative caries management protocols for that patient. And so what we want to look at, what we should be looking at are tools for prevention and arrest of dental care and as you can see here, we have a ton of tools out there for prevention and arrest of dental caries. But what has come to the forefront of the attention of what this webinar is focused on is the use of silver diamine fluoride. And in this form from SDI, this is Revastar, the two-step um, application of silver diamine fluoride and potassium iodide. So I'm going to focus on two things for you today. Basically, I'm going to talk about using that SMART procedure in our kids and when we want to use that why we want to use that, and how we're going to use that. And so that, of course, is the silver modified atraumatic restorative technique, the combination of silver diamine fluoride and atraumatic restorative technique. The application of that silver diamine fluoride followed by a glass ionomer or an atraumatic restorative technique procedure. And the second thing that I want to show you is the use of silver as a silver stainless steel crown and that would be the treatment of the caries with silver diamine fluoride followed by the application of a stainless steel crown and that will be right at the very end of my um, uh, time that I have with you. And, and just to also say one more time what an honor it is to be able to be speaking alongside these uh, very learned colleagues of mine that I get to present with today. It's, it's quite a thrill. From the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, again, indications and usage of silver diamine fluoride are for our high caries risk patients with either anterior or posterior active cavitated lesions. So we need to be able to have an active cavitated lesion. I need to be able to see that lesion and to get my silver diamine fluoride onto that lesion 
if we've got a, uh, a groove or a pit where I can't really access that caries with the silver diamine fluoride, it's not going to be effective. If you can't touch it with silver diamine fluoride, you're not going to be able to arrest that caries. So cari cavitated caries lesions in those individuals that have behavioral behavioral or medical management challenges, perhaps patients that have special health care needs. Silver diamine fluoride is particularly useful for in these types of patients that have these challenges. Patients that have multiple cavitated carious lesions that can't be treated all in one visit. So you see that child that comes in and they've got four quadrants of decay, as is so um, painfully frequent. And you can go in and you can treat all of the quadrants of decay with a single drop of silver diamine fluoride, Vrivastar, uh, this combination. Difficult to treat cavitated dental caries lesions. So lesions in possibly what you would look at a partially erupted molar, six-year molar that perhaps is coming in with molar incisor hypomineralization hasn't completely erupted yet. And we want to be able to treat that effect effectively until we can get in and isolate the tooth properly. Patients without access to or difficulty accessing dental care, rural kids, kids that come from um, even further northern communi communities than I live in, and of course active cavitated carious lesions with no clinical signs of pulpal involvement. Very, very important that we do not treat our pulpally involved teeth with our Riva star. That is not something that we want to do. Like Dr. Knight said, rubbing salt in a wound, don't do that. The AAPD policy in silver diamine fluoride, it supports that use of silver diamine fluoride as part of an ongoing caries management plan. So we can't just place the silver diamine fluoride and leave our patients. That has to be an ongoing caries management plan for them. The AAPD supports third-party reimbursement for fees. So as Dr. Justin was telling us about his uh, experiences with reimbursement fees, this is supported by American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry as well. The delegation of application of silver diamine fluoride to our auxiliary dental personnel. So the auxiliary dental personnel have the ability and the knowledge and depending upon your state or your provincial um, uh, rules and regulations, the auxiliaries can in some states and provinces place a Revastar uh, on behalf of the uh, a dentist for that patient. And of course, consultation with patient parent informed consent. Again, Dr. Justin went over that as well with our informed consent so that our patients are always very well aware, our parents in this case, of course, are very well aware of what it is that we're doing and what our abilities and capabilities and limitations are of whatever material or medicament that we're placing for that patient supporting the education of dental students, residents, other oral health care professionals, and so that they can know the pros and cons, the abilities of placement of Riva Star, and of course, encouraging more practice-based research to be conducted on SDF and evaluate its efficacy. This is a landmark paper that was written by Drs. Crystal and Drs. Naderman that was published in the Journal of Pediatric Dentistry, and this can be found again on American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry resources. This study was done, they took a uh, uh, 10 clinical trials that were carried out in six different countries with almost 4,000 children. And among other things that this study came out with in the end, the best evidence silver diamine fluoride was showed a led to a nearly 80% reduction in both caries progression and subsequent caries on treated teeth. So as we have seen in some of my uh, previous colleagues presentations today, we cannot place a silver diamine fluoride, the Revastar on patients that have any metal allergies. That's a contraindication. There is a possibility of gingivitis or mucositis if we are to contact any soft tissues with our silver diamine fluoride Revastar product. It does have a, a metallic, a bitter taste to it. And if you do get this on the patient's tissues, it will temporarily stain skin or oral tissues, which does resolve actually faster than, than two weeks. And of course, caries 
that is arrested with silver does appear dark brown or black and that's an aesthetic. So this is uh, what a, a silver treated tooth would look like with um, just the silver. And of course that is undesirable to many of our patients to have that black staining. Reva Star from SDI has dealt with this problem of the staining by having the application also, of course, of the potassium iodide. And this has been explained by my colleagues ahead of me this morning. So this is a two-step system. And what you see is the individual capsules that are available, but also it's available in a bottle system. I don't have that bottle system yet in Canada. I have that uh, individual system, which is great because that's great for our infection control. And it, uh, if we have these capsules that aren't open, then we have no problem with any evaporation of the material. So in this single cast so form, what we have is 0.05 milliliters of silver fluoride and ammonia in your silver capsule. It's got a nice matching silver brush so you don't get confused and mix them up. And the contents of that are 35 to 40% silver fluoride weight to volume and a 15 to 20% ammonia weight to volume. And in your green capsule or in your green bottle, you have the potassium iodide, which of course minimizes our black stain. So that is the Revastar from SDI. Our silver capsule, again, can be placed as a topical agent, and that's going to arrest dental caries. It's very easy to, to apply. If we're just putting our silver diamine fluoride on there, that silver, no local anesthetic is required, and we don't actually even have to do any drilling. So in our very uncooperative children that we can't get in there with a handpiece at all and remove any tooth structure, we can place that silver and arrest caries. What the potassium does is it again is a topical agent and it is going to minimize that stain caused by our silver diamine fluoride. Of course, we will need to cover it to keep that potassium iodide action in place. For those of you that have any concerns or questions about toxicity, about fluorosis of placing silver diamine fluoride, potassium iodide on our children, the recommended safe maximum dose of silver diamine fluoride per visit is one drop per 10 kilos. So for those of you that are in the States, 10 kilos is about 22 pounds of a patient. I don't think that too many of our generalists out there are seeing kids that are less than 10 kilos in weight and many, many, many studies. This is just a small sampling talking about the uh, possibility of toxicity and fluorosis when using silver in children and adults. And there's many, many studies showing the safety and the efficacy of using silver for our patients and not to worry about that. And once again, I can't say this too many times, do take caution. The use of silver is not for direct contact with the dental pulp or pulply involved teeth. So do not use this on a pulply involved tooth. Now I get to share with you my clinical slides because this is what I am as a clinical dentist. This is a before and after of a case where I've used silver diamine fluoride. This patient is isolated. This is a very deep decay and you can see a very close-up image of that decay for that patient, very demineralized or hypomineralized tooth that we have here. And I want to borrow this slide from Dr. Knight and his um, comments about needing to etch prior to the use of the Riva Star to allow for that maximum penetration of our silver for our patients. We want Want to etch for 15 seconds whenever possible, not always possible in our very pre-cooperative patients, but when we can do a total etch for that patient prior to the placement of our silver, then we want to do that. So this is our patient and I have cleaned up the margins of this tooth. If this was a, a truly completely uncooperative patient, then I would be placing the 
the silver from the Riva star directly without excavation of anything and bringing that patient back here. You can see the darkness of that precipitate from the silver starting to form already. You don't always see this darkness. If I have uh, too much of a light source as I'm working, you'll see the silver uh, turning dark faster than if you have no light source whatever whatsoever. So you, you probably can't quite make it out in here, but the silver placement uh, in this slide, you can the silver placement with our uh, silver brush so that we don't have contamination. And then we're going to be placing I'll place the potassium iodide next. So the single capsule with the green brush into that area. And uh, as Dr. Ron had said, you start to see this creamy type of a precipitate, almost like a diecal color. You continue to rub that in until the area turns uh, clear. So our truly uncooperative patients, um, you might have to stop at the time where you've just placed the silver. You might be able to have cooperation, hopefully until you can place the potassium. But truly what we want to strive for is that smart procedure that I spoke of, where we have the silver modified atrium Traumatic restorative technique, a combination of silver diamine fluoride and a traumatic restorative technique where we would follow it up by the placement of the glass ionomer. So this is a glass ionomer that is available from SDI. This is Riva Self Cure, pure glass ionomer, self cure material placed in bulk and it will self cure on its own. So very fast and very effective and placement immediately after. So this was the potassium iodide, rub it in until it's clear and then placement of our pure glass ionomer. And this is a photograph of that patient. Now, if we want to have more of a definitive restoration, we look at placing a silver sandwich technique. And that silver sandwich technique, we build upon that same patient by now adding a, a little bit of a composite layer to it. So we have to now bond our composite to it. This is Riva Bond LC. This is a light cure resin reinforced glass ionomer bonding agent, again from SDI, placement on top of our pure glass ionomer, and then placement of a composite. In this case, I'm going to be using Aura, the bulk fill material placement on there, and that's our final restoration. So this, in this case, would be a definitive restoration from start to finish. And I'll go through that one more time without any of the stops on a different case showing you our silver sandwich technique in the co-cure silver sandwich technique, which unfortunately fortunately wasn't developed by me, but was developed by Dr. Knight. So this is a cross section of our co-cure silver sandwich technique. At the base at the bottom, you see there we have our dentin and the layer of the silver diamine fluoride potassium iodide, that Riva star from, from SDI. A chemical bond you see here between that and the pure glass ionomer. And then we have either a layer of resin modified glass ionomer restorative or a layer of our Riva bond. This layer is the glue. And you would choose between one and the other depending on how deep your restoration is. If it's not very, very deep, then I'm putting on just the Riva bond and then the composite layer on top. We co-cure these all together, composite resin shrinks, right? And then our resin modified glass ionomer or our resin modified glass ionomer bonding agent, the Riva bond will expand, and then the heat will cause expansion of our glass ionomer material as well. And that gives us this great cascading effect of curing so that we have a very strong bond and adhesion of all of our materials. 
We'll look at this little fellow here. This is a six year molar. He's about seven years of age. He's also a special needs patient with a very, very deep decay. So we had ended up putting off treatment of this lesion for far too long, uh, hoping that he would become cooperative enough to sit in the chair. In the end, he did not. We took him in to our surgical center and ended up in a general anesthetic situation with this child to treat this decay. So you've got to say, why are you using Rivastar on this child if they're under general anesthetic? We got great cooperation. This is the depth of decay on this child that I showed you at the outset. Very deep decay on that six-year molar, almost approximating the pulp. So he's asymptomatic. I can still go in there and uh, treat this tooth and save it from visiting our local endodontist by using our Revastar, which is exactly what I'm going to do for him. So I want to be sure that I have got some very clean margins for this child. So I've gone in and done almost a traditional type of a prep till I got to sound enamel, but I've still got a lot of deep, soft decay. I want to get out as much of the decay as I can without invading the pulp. I wanna give my silver an ample opportunity to penetrate to the depth of this. So cleaning it out with a great big round, round burr, and then I'm gonna place my silver onto that. Remember, this is our silver co-cure technique. So I've got great adhesion of all of our materials and a good strong final restoration. So silver placement, a little too much light on there so I can see the darkness there. Placement now of our potassium here and on as that creamy uh, precipitate uh, looking uh, material and then keep rubbing it in until it's clear and then placement of my Riva self-cure at the base and somebody ahead of me, I think it might have been Dr. Justin, described this as like filling an ice cream cone. Make sure we don't have any voids of that material. Riva Bond LC is next. This is my glue. I'm putting this on top. I'm also using my Riva Bond onto my enamel here. This has all been total etched before. Use that Riva Bond onto that enamel so that we can bond our composite to the enamel as well. I want to seal everything completely. And I'm going to be using the Aura Easy Flow. I believe um, Dr. Ron had mentioned this one already. As And this is a, a lovely, lovely material, great mechanical property and that I'm placing on top and then I'm curing everything all together and this is our final restoration for this little fellow to save him from the endodontist, our before and our after. I have a very short video, not sure if I don't think that you can hear the music, but I can. This is also on my Instagram if you wanted to look on that. Placement of our Riva Silver on another case. And I fast forwarded this for you so that you don't have to sit through a couple minutes application. The potassium iodide, wash the potassium iodide. This is placement of our pure glass ionomer. Riva Bond on top. And now this is Luna that I'm using here in this final restoration of the co-cure technique. We'll shape it and cure it. And then I'm playing a, placing a final flowable composite top coat layer onto this child here. And this is our silver sandwich co-cure technique. And finally, I will, I have a little bit of theory. I won't have time to go over that because I do want to show you, I only have a few minutes left, the silver stainless steel crown. As I said at the outset, treatment of this with sil of the silver stainless steel crown tooth with silver diamine fluoride or the Riva Star followed by a stainless steel crown. And what this is going to do is this is going to arrest the caries again in deep areas. So we have have here uh, in this radiograph the upper six-year molar. I would call that 16 here in uh, Canada. You would probably call that tooth number three, I think, in the States. And so preparation for a stainless steel crown, but I am uh, concerned in this particular case, as we are in so many, that I would invade the pulp if I got out all of the uh, decay. So I'm placing silver onto this tooth, 
prior to the stainless steel crown to further arrest decay. So if you think that you've got arrested decay, and this question came up in one of the other presentations, somebody would say, why aren't we using this as a caries detection? And remember, the silver is only going to stain carious dentin. It's not going to stain our our dentin or our enamel that sound. So take a look at this. We think we've gotten it all out and that is what is left behind that's stained. So there is very clearly some active caries. And this is, as I said before, this is a permanent tooth, six year molar. I'm placing a stainless steel crown on it because this tooth was affected by molar incisor hypomineralization. That patient needed full coverage. And last but not least is one of my more recent favorite uses of silver is with the Hall technique. If you're not familiar with that, the Hall technique is a technique of placement of stainless steel crowns that was developed by a general practitioner in Scotland, identified during an audit of the practices there. And what she had developed using was to cement a stainless steel crown over carious primary molar without the use of local anesthetic. There's no caries removal in this technique, Lo no local anesthetic, no, no shot or numbing as you call it in the States, no tooth preparation. It's been used since 1988. I don't have time in the scope of this presentation to tell you the uh, amount of literature that has been done on this since then showing the efficacy of this technique, but here I'll show you a clinical slides a series of one of my patients, and this is a carious second primary molar in an uncooperative child. This is a failure of a, of a previous treatment, and so we have decay in there. We need to have full coverage for this child. I have treated that caries with silver. What you see posterior to that second primary molar is an orthodontic separator, which in this slide has already been in place now for a week or so to make some space. I've got space on the mesial because I've got all that decay. This child comes into practice after the silver has been placed, after the separator has been in place, Place for a week or two, we fit the crown and literally cement that crown over top of everything after removal of the separator, obviously, or maybe not so obviously, remove the separator and place it over top. The crown is high, of course, we haven't done any preparation. This child's going to leave the practice within one to two weeks, that child will intrude that tooth with his occlusion. I have not yet to date had any clinically people have any reports of, of difficulties with occlusion. They bite it into place. Kids treating kids is a wonderful thing. I don't know what you're talking about, Lou. They're the best. This is that child back two weeks later. See that beautiful, beautiful occlusion. And so we have multiple uses for our Revastar and our practices. Remember folks, I always show this slide. I love this quote from Dale Carnegie, knowledge isn't power until it's applied. You learn all of these new techniques and new materials and um, you gotta go back to your practices and use them. Don't, don't be afraid. Take that leap and use them. And this ends uh, my part of the presentation and I'd open it up to questions. Thank you. So Carla, quick question. First question that I'm getting asked, do you routinely, when you're doing your technique with Reva Star Acid Etch for 15 seconds now? So, and you know, that's, that's the, the great question. We know that uh, evidence shows us that if we can acid etch for the 15 seconds prior to the placement of silver, that we're gonna have better penetration. But as I said at the outset of my 30 minutes with you, what is realistic to be carrying through on a patient that is uncooperative versus what is possible. We can't always get in and acid etch on an uncooperative pre-cooperative child without risk of getting that acid etch all over that patient's mouth. And so ideally, yes, you want to do that total etch technique. However, the reality is we can't always get in and do that reliably. 
So a couple more questions and Jeff and Ron and Janine, you can all join us if you can with your video cams. How close do you feel you can come? We obviously don't wanna to go to a pulpal exposure. So, I mean, let's say you're a half a millimeter away and you did that, you know, trying to save that tooth from a root canal. What are your thoughts? Is there a zone that you can be comfortable with that you just don't want to come too close? I mean, so you're spooning out the decay or removing it. When do you stop? Carl, I'll ask you that. That's, that's the million dollar question, Lou. When do you stop? If we had that crystal ball, we would know when to stop and we would know when, when we've gone too far and, and how far is too far. So we want to go uh, far enough so that we've got a restoration that is going to be viable and we don't want to go too far so that we've uh, invaded the pulp. So clinically, we have to take a look and we have to see what things look like clinically on the tooth. We need to say what it looks like radiographically. And I can say that when I'm treating kids too, and the kids that are not, uh, you know, have, are not under general anesthetic, the kids that are in my practice awake, we have to go and see how cooperative that patient is and how far we can we can go for treatment with that child whether they're cooperative or uncooperative but also bottom line to remember is that we don't want to have the treatment of the silver diamine fluoride on a patient's tooth that is symptomatic so don't don't invade that pulp so what i'll do is i'm going to go to the professor dr knight and then if anybody else, just raise your hand. Uh, Jeff, tell me closeness. When do we, this is the typical question. When do we stop spooning? I mean, decay. Uh, Luke, uh, caries is, you say that does, does, does caries cause decay or is decay really a response by the, by the uh, dentine pulp complex mm -hmm. against bacteria invasion? And I say it's that. So. Caries is really an inflammatory reaction of dentine. And so therefore, like any tissue, it's, you, you actually treat it as inflammatory tissue. And that we put, what you do on the skin is you put a piece of iodide on there and help the tooth to heal itself. See, we also, we've all seen arrested caries. We don't, we, don't need to remove arrest, we don't need to remove the caries dentine. All you need to remove is a soft hanging fruit that you, that you can't get a bond to. So I leave as much caries behind as I possibly can because that caries is going to turn into a decay resistant base beneath the restoration. Right. Because it's full of, it's full of, it's, I mean, who's a, do you ever see caries in arrested caries? Right, no. No, no. no. Okay, you don't. So exactly, exactly so what you're doing is you're helping the tooth to turn the caries into arrested caries. And therefore you leave as much as possible. The only thing is, you know, this, this always comes with a caveat. If you're doing an, in a sort of a deep class two cavity prep where you can't see the where you can't see the margins, that's why I cut that little moat along there because that's my my Carey's parachute. And the reason I do that is because I've been doing this for a long time, and every now and again, by not doing that little moat, something comes back and bites me on the backside. I'm and with you. So I'm, I'm going to keep this going fast. So Jeff. Let's call bottom line. I've got Justin, Carla, Janine, and Ron on this. Do okay. we all agree or disagree that let's say we go into that deep restoration and there's soft like mush. Do we want to get out the mush and then treat it with the silver first, the SDF? That's what I'm going to ask the panel. Ron? Yeah, listen, my, my rule of thumb is like this. Get the mush out, leave all that stuff the brown stuff that you got to really scoop out that you know is going to come out leave that behind i think that's what jeff is saying get the spongy mush out and then go ahead and and apply the sdf Carla? so i just wanted to say something about this too right i get out as much mush as as i can if i'm planning to put a definitive restoration in right. okay so there there's uh, evidence out there talking about it, incomplete caries removal in both primary and permanent teeth and the possibility of failure of that restoration. So what the silver is going to do, of course, is it's going to, um, it's going to create that hard area so that we've got that safety belt or parachute or seatbelt or whatever you want to call it so that we don't have failure of that restoration. 
So if we can get that silver diamine fluoride and have that area of hardness, and there's, I've got evidence in some of my slides too talking about that, that area of hardness, how hard it is, then we have less possibility of failure of our definitive restoration. Got it, Janine? So for us, right, as long as there we have solid walls, we'll take out, we can leave a margin of untreated lesions on the pulpal floor, as long as we have solid walls and it's cleansable. Uh, we usually will try and bring the child back if we want to do something more definitive, but we we agree wholeheartedly with uh, with Dr. Knight with leaving leaving that particular margin there. We're not looking for whole perforation, and right. we're trying really hard not to do the the whole thing about making or treating a symptomatic tooth. Right, uh, Justin, comments? Yeah, you guys ever have like a, a good banana, like a good like a healthy banana, but it's got a couple of those brown spots. It's yep. like that brown spot that you can almost wipe off with your finger and the other stuff underneath is soft, but it doesn't really just come off easy. That's right. like what I'm always picturing when I'm taking it out. Right. Jeff, final comment before I move on. Okay. I've been, I've been doing this for 20 years. And when I started doing it, I was taking out lots of, lots of caries and gradually in the process of sort of just pulling back a bit, pulling back a bit. And now you, you talk about removing the mush. Removing the mush, I do with a dental explorer. So I run a dental explorer around the cavity. Um, I get out, you know, get out the sort of the, the seeds that get in there, the bits of food, the blood pus, and all that sort of stuff. But the, all you, the cavity preparation you need to do is, particularly on occlusal restoration, is just go around with a dental explorer and get rid of all that sort of soft, really dentine. Okay, as long as you've got a firm margin in a proximal box, it's different because you can't exactly see what's going on, particularly. If you if you actually go beyond the go through the uh, the dental enamel junction, and, and or the or the the, the enamel uh, cemental junction. Okay, so what I do down there is I run a I run a, a number three round burr, the little mo the sound dentine around the perimeter, that gives me a biological seal, and I leave everything else behind us to to remineralize. Got it. So let me say one definitive bottom line here that we all agree. We have to be putting the restoration on definitive margins. Janine touched on this. You, your enamel margins have to be clean because that's ultimately what we're restoring to. And I hope we all agree on that. So everybody out there, there's always this thing of mush is mush. However you wanna take out what Justin said is that brownish area. I just have to tell you in all my teachings, Leaving decay for decades has been shown in the literature as long as you get a seal and you have to have a definitive margin. So Janine touched on that. I think it's absolutely essential. Okay, we have got over 60 questions flying in. The first question that was just related to this is, can we put SDF on permanent teeth with deep decay? Obviously the answer is yes. That's been the whole intent of this course to minimize drilling. I want everybody to get to this point. If you leave decay and use F SDF and Reva Star, it will neutralize the decay so you don't have to drill as deep. Jeff, am I missing that as the bottom line for people in this course today? No, that's the bottom line. I mean, you, 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 you say caries is an inflammatory reaction of, of dentine, and therefore by putting the Reva Star on is like, is like putting iodide on a wound and you're helping the tooth to heal itself. Because we all seen arrested caries, we know the teeth can heal themselves under the right conditions. Exactly. So but I'm gonna go, and, and there's so many questions, so I, I'm just gonna- I got a comment here just real quick. I know we have a yeah. lot, but I think it's really critical. You know, one of the things that, and you know me, I'm all about communication. I think it's critical when we're doing these procedures that we communicate to our patients and tell them what we did. If they go to another dentist and they see a restoration with still some decay underneath, the first thing they're gonna say is, you went to a crappy dentist. So you must tell the patient, I am using an advanced state-of-the-art technique to heal your tooth. Some dentists may not know what it looks like. Things may change over time, but this is what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. I think it's just a very important point. Yeah, Ron, that's, a, that's a really important point. And, and when, I, when I first started doing this, I actually had a patient the exact the same thing happened to me. And she, she went to another dentist and he said, who is this crappy guy you've been to see? It actually went up to the board. Unfortunately, the board members knew what I was up to and I got away with it. So what I've done now, what I, I don't do it anymore because I've been doing it for so long, I don't care, I can handle it. But if it, what I did it for many years 
is to have a, a sheet that I handed out to patients and I explained what I was doing, exactly what I was healing. The, I talked about healing the tooth and it takes a while for the tooth to harden up. And um, you can see those slides I showed you that the teeth do heal. But right. it, happens, it happens over a period of time. But Keeping the pace going. So for when you have an occlusal small cavity, per this course, I want everybody to understand that. Do you open up this small cavity before placing the etch and then obviously SDF and the potassium iodide? That is the technique. Yes or no, Ron? That is 100%. Listen, it's uh, exactly the steps that I showed in that in, in that uh, in the clinical simulation, if you will, or the lab simulation. But it's the same steps over and over again. And, and, and I and I've been using it again a lot. And it, and I'll say it again: no sensitivity, which is really for me that real caveat in this whole process. And, and, and openly, if you have a small lesion, Jeff and Carl and Janine, if you have a small lesion and you're seeing it's getting close to the dentin, why drill into the dentin? That's what the whole purpose of this, it's minimally invasive dentistry. Janine, wouldn't you agree on that? Absolutely. I really generally like sound enamel. So if I exactly. can do whatever I can keep it, I'm going to try and do that. That, it, and that's such a, I mean, that's everyday dentistry, everyday dentistry. So Jeff, another question is, and Ron's technique also showed, you use routinely a, just a traditional phosphoric etch, correct? Yep. Yes. Okay, Ron? 100%, correct. Okay, next question. So we saw examples, Justin, of doctors applying the silver diamine fluoride and then the potassium iodide and we see some burning of the tissue. Ron showed it, you're, you're now rinsing after you place the potassium iodide. Would you recommend first surgically suctioning the potassium iodide, minimizing the chances of it just getting on any exposed tissue? That was a question. Yeah, you could do that. I mean, uh, it really comes down to making sure that you're you're putting some sort of barrier, just like a Vaseline or something on the tissue too. Um, but you could suction it off for sure. It's so fast, like like Jeff was saying, you know, it's, it really starts quick. Uh, it's not as long as the, the silver diamine fluoride. You can kind of just put it on, put it on, step one, step two, and then suction it off. And using a gingival barrier, whether SDI's alternate, there are many gingival barriers so I'm just curious on a desensitization procedure from the panel, if you're doing a class five and someone says, this is so sensitive, do you routinely put a gingival barrier on the gum and then place the SDF and then the potassium iodide? Justin, walk me through how you desensitize teeth. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've had several cases um, where, you know, like you said, Revastar on brand in, in the US is a desensitizing agent. So I'll use my, my gingival barrier. And I mean, I have so much just from other things to whitening the gingival barrier that's left over from that you can use that for a class five um it just really protects the tissue um you want that patient to feel the results of the desensitizing immediately you don't want them to have sensitive gum right. right after so uh, i think it's a good technique to do it that way okay jeff i'm gonna go back to you and this scares me when i ask you this question because we only have 30 minutes left so People have asked about the endodontic use of SDF. So as you're thinking of how you're gonna reply, tell me why this is so special to use. And are you using this as part of your canal, op, you know, as far as your instrumentation, if you can't get through, give me a two minute answer if you can in two minutes, go. No, less than that, it's an adjunct. So normal, normal uh, endodontic protocol, you, just before you obturate, you put a you put a, a uh, you wash out the cavity. You dry the pulp chamber. Put a paper point down there. Put your Reva star on the pulp chamber. You take it within a within a millimeter of the apex because you don't want it going through. Remember, it's sold on a wound. Then you put your potassium iodide in. Fill up the chamber. Go down with a reamer to within a millimeter of the apex. Put your paper point down again. Take it out and then you obturate. Okay, you've got to be careful if you're using that in the in the upper molars on the buccal cusp, mesial buccal cusp. You've got to make sure you've got the you, you get the silver diamond through up there. I've used this since uh, since uh, 2005 on every root canal I've done. I've had two failures that I know about. I mean, there may be more, and both was on 
buckle cusp or meter buckle cusp of upper upper molars. Well, I didn't get the because the patient's lying back. And I didn't get the silver diameter up there. It's it's a no it's a no brainer. You saw that that yep. sort of thing. You put it up there. I mean, that's why I use it. I can't. I, I just the pH is nine. It's biologically tolerable. Um, Marita have been using it three point eight percent. But you but I tell you what, it's a. <laughs> I I my, all my root canals are two half hour visits. And uh, Got it. I just I just don't remember a failure. Lou I, have a, Lou, I have a question to that for Jeff. Jeff, what happens if something, and I think the group will want to know, what happens if someone does make an error and they do get some past the apex? What would happen, and, and, and what would the patient feel something right there and then? You only do it once, okay, because, <laughs> because the patient hits the roof and you've got to put a local in to stop the discomfort. All right. So I mean, it's look, look. You know, we use an air rotor. It's pretty dangerous. You know, you slip with an air rotor. You, you, you don't. But people come back. I've seen, I've seen dentists have sent me slides of showing the sort of this white sort of escar from silver float all over the gingival tissues. It's not supposed to go on gingival tissues. It's supposed to go on the on the caries. I mean, for goodness' sake. <laughs> Is that so, like Jordan F. Lou? Yeah. That was great, Jeff. Listen, it's point counterpoint with Lou Graham. Okay. So next question, and I am going to go to Janine and Carla. Okay, let's say you've got an uncooperative child. You could have an uncooperative geriatric patient with extreme dementia. How effective is silver diamine fluoride if you are unable to etch the tooth? Janine, Carla, then I'll get to Jeff. Janine, hit it. So we actually have had a few people that are that qualify on the on the more specialized care side of things in which have actually gone to the operating room and due to bruxing managed to go and pop out several of the the restorations that we have but come back unable to communicate where the pain is so it's been truly very effective of course it's got to be fast because when you're over the age of 25 and you are special needs more often than not there's a lot of energy that comes from these special adults and or children so it's been um, very, very effective, even when we've come, well, even like a week or two after when we call them, it's uh, hard to get them in and out. So it's great to be able to acid etch if you have the time, but if I can take the few minutes on a moving target, you, uh, it, it works out even, it works out great. It still works out really, truly very effective. Carla? So I um, really agree 100% with, with what you just said and put very well. Um, there, there's a saying that uh, don't let perfection be the enemy of good. So it goes something like that. I might have, yeah. it. you know, we, we can't always get in and total etch. Um, we can often get in when we have an uncooperative, even wildly uncooperative patient and get some amount of silver onto that lesion. And that's going to be a benefit. So yes, we got ideal, but we also got reality. Love it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna now switch to Ron, Justin and Jeff. So the question, and it, it's come up repeatedly in the chat line, why can't I just put a composite over the silver, the SDF and the potassium iodide? I don't understand this, people say. Why can't I just do a composite? Now, Jeff, in one minute, explain why you have to put something before the composite. Okay. Um, de uh, re Resin-based dentine bonding systems will not bond to, uh, to a tooth that's been treated with silver fluoride or silver fluoride potassium iodide. Resin-modified glass I meant adhesives do. I mean, it's as simple as that. So sure, go ahead and put your composites on there, but they're going to leak and they're going to fall out. But if you put a resin-modified glass adhesive there, you can use Reva bond, uh, Fuji bond, um, uh, Reva, uh, Reva, and you can use a straight a resin modified glass on the cement, but you've got, you've got to put a thin layer down and photo cure that because if you don't photo cure a resin modified glass on cement with a thin layer, you've got free hema there and that will cause post op sensitivity. Say that again. Okay. If you're using a resin modified glass on the cement, there's a Tim Watson, I'm going to, my, Tim Watson did some work in England in the 90s that. You see, you see, you see free hema above the above the cavity, and the problem is that, that because the glass on the cement is so opaque, the curing light doesn't go down all the way down, and if you don't set the hema, 
all right? So yeah. what you do is yeah. you get you get a, a resin modified glass on cement down, you put a thin light, you put a small blob on the cavity and you run it over the cavity walls and you photo cure it. That seals it, okay? That's yeah. polyhedma, that's, that's, that's contact lenses. And then you put your glass on the cement, resin modified glass on the cement on top and that will actually go ahead. It doesn't matter if there's free hema there because it's already sealed. So the question then is, are you better off putting a pure glass ionomer over the SDI, I mean, over the SDF, potassium iodide, Revastar, or are you better off just putting an RMGI over it? Okay, I'll tell you what I do. Put the Revastar there, I go ahead and I put, the, I put, a, I put a little bit of uh, resin modified glass on cement there, okay? Run it over the run it over the walls of the cavity, photo cure it. Fill it up with the res modified glass on cement, leave a little bit in the capsule. Okay, photo cure that just below the contact area. Then I put the, the little bit of res modified glass on cement back onto the surface, run it, and then I just put composite on top of that. Bang. So it's a, it's a sort of squirt swipe plot. It's very fast, it's very quick. Uh, and I mean the whole thing is meant, I don't charge for using Reva Star. Because a cavity that would take me forty minutes, I do it in fifteen minutes. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm doubling. I'm doubling. My, I mean, I've only got one pair of hands, and the, what the Reva Star does to me, it speeds. It, it puts me in a sort of a like putting on the afterburn on F111. I really take off the speed. I move across the ground. Ron, any any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, your so, technique. Well, listen. I, I think again, especially in the states, time is money, right? And the ability to isolate and keep things dry becomes critical. So if, I, if, if, if I'm gonna place Riva on the floor, I now have to wait that 60 seconds for it to really cure because it's a self-cure glass onomer. Right. If I can get away with an RMGI and still get that bond, which I have done many, many, many times, and then light cure that real quickly, then go through my adhesive process, I'm more inclined to, to do that. And I've, I've been successful placing the RMGI on the floor, then going through the adhesive process like I showed you. Uh, in that video. It's just a question of waiting for that minute to cure. Lou, I saw there was a question that just popped up to this. Someone just said, can you use Activa on the floor, pulp dense Activa on the floor? And my guess would be yes. It's an RMGI in the sense it's a, it's, it's, it's a resin ionomer. So I'm guessing you probably could. Justin, any thoughts on this? Um, I'm more, I just use self-care in my practice, but like you said, it's just, it's the, it's a timing thing. Um, my pace is just probably a little bit slower right now. Um, but I think, and going back to the, the Activa, I think that would be a good, you know, a good use. And I think that would work as well. We have options. And honestly, if you, even if in a self-care, if you fill the whole thing up and then prep two millimeters down, clean margins, you etch and bond and just put your final composite on it. And you've still done a, there's so many different ways to do a smart technique, so to speak. So another question asks, can you place an amalgam right on top of this? Jeff, can you? Of course. Okay. That's, that's the quickest answer I've ever heard from Jeff Knight. <laughs> that was a record. Okay. So the question then is, Justin, I'm going to go back to you. Are you routinely using Revastar on all deep restorations on asymptomatic teeth? On asymptomatic teeth, yeah. Um, anytime I, I have a, a deep restoration that I'm concerned about, like Ron was saying, sensitivity, that's the, that's the key thing is, is you don't end up with sensitivity. Um, so you place the Revastar, I'll use my self-care, like you said, occasionally I'll have them come back, I'll cut it back and veneer with the composite etch, bond, all that stuff and veneer with the composite over it. And that's their final restoration. It looks great. Uh, there's no sensitivity. A um, few more steps involved with, with my process, but it's just what's worked for me so far. I think part of the key is, is what we've seen so far is that so many times we're, we think we're done removing the decay. You put a composite in, which has micro leakage, and it's just going to be recurrent decay. So I guess I go back to, if you were in a deep restoration, why wouldn't you use the smart technique, Justin? Um, again, I, if, if the tooth was symptomatic, if it was something that you were concerned, if you had a pulpal exposure or something like that, yeah. but other than that, I don't really okay. have a... Carla, Janine, I'm going to ask this question. What if someone else has done SDF and the patient's teeth come in dark and stained and they want the stain removed? They don't like it. Now, what do you do? Janine, what do you do? Uh, well, on the posterior teeth, we, we can actually use, we will we'll polish everything down, we'll etch it. It all depends on how cooperative the patient is. If it's a dark stain, we usually advise the parent 
you know, we that it'll stay there for a little while longer until the child's able to sit comfortably in a chair for them to get a whiter filling to be done. Sometimes if it's, uh, we have the opportunity of doing, ugh, though I don't really like them all that much, uh, ceramic crowns. Yeah. Uh, that, those are very viable options. We can put stainless steel crowns on them. They may not like that even more. Uh, we do uh, strip crowns if we have to over that particular thing. We sometimes will try and opaque it with a particular liner before you put a strip crown if we think that there's a problem with that. It depends on which tooth, how old. There's a lot of different variables that come along with it with an aesthetic restoration. So I think I, I, I'm trying to cover as much as I can. And Mark Lotta, uh, the dean at Creighton, who's a personal friend of mine, said, and we have to be careful here what we recommend. Personally, in my experience with Activa, and what Mark comments, and it's really more of a resin that I bond in. So I'm gonna go back to what Jeff has said. I really wanna use a glass ionomer or RMGI directly over this, this treated SDF potassium iodide too. So I really, really think this is really, really important. So I'm not gonna advocate Activa for this directly over it. Jeff, thoughts? Look, if you, if you have to use a composite, glass on the cement's a wonderful material. Actually, so it does all that. It's like it's like it's like dentine. You put the you put the the, the, the you, you replace doing a restoration. You replace the dentine with glass on the cement, and you replace the enamel with with uh, with composite. Uh, in a proximal cavity, in a in a sandwich restoration, you use ordinary glass on the cement. It breaks down because it, because but if you use a resin modified glass on the cement. It breaks down, but it's much more slowly, and therefore you can use it in an open sandwich. And so the technique that I use is very quick, is, but the important thing, you've got to get that seal because the res modified glass on cement, if you're using that in cavities, 8% post-operative sensitivity. I've had a patient who sued me once because I, in the early days when I started doing this, and I had to sort of drill down and find out, that's a good word, isn't it? Find out what the cause was. So you've got to put a little bit down, spread it over the cavity, photo cure it, Put your glass on them, put your res modified glass on them, spent down, exposing the, the proximal surface because it might break down. Then you put your composite resin over the top. Okay, so got it. So let me ask you this I've got hygienists asking questions. What if you apply this to a carious lesion that you do not plan to restore? As long as there's no pain or symptoms, why not just etch and put this on and bring the patient back? In other words, it's an open lesion. Is there anything wrong for the hygienist to do that, and how would she document it? Justin, no, no, no. What do you think? Yeah. I, I, for me, the big thing is cleansability. Um, if they can clean, if they can keep that area clean, if it's not plaque retentive, yeah. um, then I think that's okay. Uh, it's when that area is going to be continually catching food and debris. Right. Um, that SDF, that whatever you put there, is going to be fighting a losing battle. I think that's a great concise answer. Uh, thank you so much on that. Um, is there a time frame to allow before you see radi radiographic remineralization? Jeff, what's your time frame? What do you see it immediately? If you're using if you're using uh, Reva Star with a high with a high pH, you see it immediately. But you'll certainly see it after after two weeks. Got it. After two weeks. Two weeks you start to see, but you know, well after I mean, I, I think it varies on teeth, but you know, six weeks you saw it. At 14, at 14 weeks, um, 14 months, the, the two is completely healed. Got it. So just again, going on, what is keeping the tooth from staining? Is it the potassium iodide? Group? Okay, no, it's a, the potassium iodide will break down under a curing light. Okay. But if you, but, but if you etch it for 15 seconds, you expose the you expose the the denatured collagen. Potassium iodide forms protein complexes with denatured collagen, and that's a very strong bond. Might break down if you just put if you just put a, do a cavity, put the silver diamine fluoride potassium iodide on, and hit it with a curing light, it'll go black. Because but but if you but because it hasn't it hasn't been able to form any of those protein bonds. But once the AGI forms on the protein bonds, it becomes a much more stable molecule and therefore it's not going to break down. That's why it's so important. If you don't want to get staining, you have to edge for 15 seconds. I think that's a great pearl and a takeaway. Thank you for that question, Laurie. Ron from Aaron. Dr. Kaminer, what codes are you using if this is a definitive restoration every time for adults? Are you changing any of your codes? 
Um, I, I still, you know, I, I looked it up actually. We typically use an indirect pulp cap. Indirect, indirect pulp cap, uh, the definition basically means is putting a compound on the dentin to promote uh, secondary or tertiary dentin. I mean, if we're seeing healing underneath, I think that's exactly what we're doing. So I'm going to, I typically put it as an indirect or charge as an indirect and then whatever restorative I'm doing. Got it. Somebody asked, can you use Equi? The answer is yes, it's a glass ionomer. Enough said on that. So another attendee asked, I'm still curious, what is considered a symptomatic tooth, Justin? What is symptomatic that you would feel comfortable? If they have some te temperature sensitivity or sweet sensitivity, would that be a contraindication? No. I have my answer, what's your answer? Yeah, no, not at all. I mean, th that that sensitivity, you're using Revistar for sensitive teeth sometimes in class five lesions. It, it, it's, uh, we're saying if it's, you know, if it's that irreversible pulpitis, um, if it's something that's, you know, necrotic, you know, right. I mean, those are the two that I would say don't use it. Great, I agree. Uh, Julie asks, I don't like thick bases. Can I just put a layer of vitrobond over the silver diamine fluoride and place that and then bond over that? Jeff, can they do that? Yes. Okay. So that would be no thicker than I believe it's one millimeter as your, you know, RMGI liner over the SDF. And Jeff says yes. So especially Jeff, if someone has not a deep restoration, that would be a nice solution if they wanted to use a bonding technique, correct? Right. Okay. Next question. And now I'm just trying to rifle them. If if you do not want to use acid, if you're worried about sensitivity, can we use acid after SDF? That has been asked and answered. The answer is no. So why does Revastar eradicate, why does Revastar indicate this is for usage over 21? Is Janine, is that because we're kind of going off label and not just using this to treat sensitivity? Okay, I lost Janine. So what do you think, Ron? Why would Revastar say the indication is for, if it, it is for over 21? You know, listen, indications are indications, right? Because it's probably in order to get an FDA approval, that's probably what they had to write. The reality is you have people like Carler and pediatric dentists using it on two-year-olds and likely because of the high pH and the controllability and in order to get FDA approval, they probably have it only for really for adults. That's my guess. I, I don't have any other reason why. Lou, with that, I have to apologize. I got to check out. I got to teach another class right now from two to three on lasers at ultradent.com. But you guys were great. And I want to thank you guys. Are you thank you. Okay, get out of here. Okay. Right. So we've got just, and it goes back to you, Justin. And I want to get this point really clear. And someone said, if I have a patient with reversible pulpitis, etching might cause sensitivity. How do you handle? I'm going to answer, and then I'll ask the panel. What we've learned today from this is, is if you've got someone with transient cold sensitivity or sweet sensitivity, which is a reversible pulpitis, what Jeff and everybody here has said is, drill less. In other words, sound borders. You can get rid of all the soft mush if you like. That's what we're still going after. And stop drilling. And if you use this material, you will decrease sensitivity. And etching will not cause the sensitivity unless you're doing a direct bulb cap. And this is not advocated for a direct bulb cap. Jeff, did I misunderstand anything in this presentation today? No, that's correct. That's correct. <laughs> okay. So, I don't, don't use it. Look, don't. If a, if a patient says, oh, there's you know, something going on up there, I stay away from it. Because the thing is that they'll, they'll turn around and say, that's that, stuff, that's that silly stuff you put on, on my tooth. You're using it off-label, and I'll get a smart lawyer to go you. And, and I, I mean, I do, I, particularly in the United States, I might say, there's a lot of that goes on. You know, people sort of, people looking for, you know, the ambulance chasers, I suppose you'd call it. I hear you. So... Let me just go for final thoughts now. Final thoughts. Justin, is there anything that you feel we have not covered of the value of Revistar in this course today? And then I'm going to ask each panelist for their final thoughts. Uh, I, I think we had a great panel. I think we had a lot of, a lot of different takes and a lot of people that do it different ways. So I, I think we've covered a lot of things. Um, I, I, don't have, I don't have anything that I, I can think off the top of my head that we missed. I will personally thank you. It's been a pleasure working with you. Carla, unmute your mic 
And I'm going to ask you, Carla, any final thoughts on kids and anything we didn't hit home on? I think that it is um, our duty to be treating our kids and our adult patients as best uh, as we can and to the best of our ability. And we need to be open to embrace new technology and new techniques that are going to help both our patients and ourselves to have better oral health. Thank Just you. do it. Thank you. Janine, final thoughts? I, I'm a huge fan of evidence-based dentistry. Uh, I like tried and true the old way in which we were taught the surgical model of dentistry. I, that's how I was learned, taught how to do things. Um, but I really genuinely like to embrace a comprehensive approach because no two patients will ever be the same. And being able to give them one, one modality or another in your office actually builds that trust. And according to pediatric dentistry, the dental home that we wish to, to establish, especially now during the time in which we have so many changes going on. Uh, so I think you did a fantastic job. Um, I would recommend uh, maybe somebody who does something with special care dentistry next time, because we have more and more kids that are diagnosed with special needs. Yep. Um, and you have some very special adults that are coming in from facilities that, you know, the state may not genuinely be ready to approve of, that if we have more evidence-based uh, conversation that maybe we can do something more for them. Yep. Thank you so much for that. Now, I just have to also say a special thanks to my buddy, Jeff. Now, I want everybody to realize it's five o'clock in the morning. He got up around 2.30 to join us, he looks sharp, and he has been on top of his game all early morning. Jeff, well, I, I, I say, say quarter past twelve. What's that? Quarter, say quarter past twelve. That's a, a quarter past and twelve. The birds, aren't, the birds aren't even singing yet. <laughs> I love it. Final thoughts before I close up, because I definitely want to say one final thing. Any final thoughts, Jeff? Right. Yeah. Look, just we haven't dealt with fissure protection. Um, and very early proximal caries. Yep. And the way yep. to do that, because um, the thing is that with fish protection, you're not sure whether there's caries there or not. It doesn't matter. 15 second etch, Reva Star, uh, put the glass on the cement on, a heavy, get a freezer bag, bar on the freezer bag, and then you just clean it off. You can do a quarter at a time, it's really fast. In a proximal initial lesions, what you do is you, you put, a, you put an a, 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 a anticoagulant down there to stop any proximal bleeding. Um, edge 15 seconds. You go in there with a, with a what are those? Do they have fixtures in the states? Have what? Well, they're, they're fixtures. These little micro brushes. Yes. These little proximal brushes. So you go in with a in a proximal brush with the with the um, with the uh, with the Reva with the Reva uh, with the Reva Star potassium iodide, uh, potassium silver fluoride potassium iodide. You then get a a, a looting cement, a resin modified or, or just a straight looting cement. You put it on the micro brush, you go in there interproximately, back and forwards like that, interproximately. And then when it starts to set, you get some dental floss and go up and down like that, and you'll you'll restore some cavities. I've got patients, I've got I've got slides showing two years follow-up where the caries have healed. There's been absolutely no uh, interproximal restoration at all. The only thing I don't know is how what size cavity you can do that to. So I that's think Jeff, for, that's something maybe for Justin to look at. <laughs> I think, Jeff, here's what I would like to do. I will request, we'll work this out over the weekend, just more work for us. I, I, I do believe so much in the sealant system you just talked about. And so why not, what we'll do is let's come up with kind of a correspondence we'll send out to all the people on this, along with the class two minimally invasive technique. I think we, we, we need to spend more time on that in itself. And I, I can't think enough. Here's my bottom line in practicing 35 plus years. My goal is to get people's teeth to their 85th birthday. And my feeling is the more we drill, the less we have at their 85th birthday. And that's what every panelist has been on here about. And the literature shows you don't have to drill until you get clean dentin. This entire course has been about how we minimize endodontic outcomes in fact, Jeff even talked about endo, but how we minimize endodontics and the needs for endodontics with deep and what I would call reversible pulpitis type teeth. 
I can't thank everybody enough, but if we keep thinking we're going to keep teeth for 85 years, it's about, I think less is more. And that's what I'd like to conclude on today.